the saddle. Here we go. I'm officially back home for a while. Buckle your seatbelts, children. It's gonna be a rough ride, especially today. Maywalt, the Maywalt episode. Been meaning to do this for a while anyway, so why the hell not? Let's do it. If you're ready. Hope you're wearing your steel toed boots. Argument is it's why, disgusting. My argument is why can't women? <laughs> sorry, be, I'm sorry. Why can't women be beautiful, fragile, and strong? <laughs> well, because that because it, it, it's it's why a Why can't we? Like, why well, can't we be multiple strength? things? Because it's because it's, it's a it's a strength. paradox. Well, it's a paradox. I don't know. I don't. It's like ha, wait, ha, but have you seen have you seen a plastic wine glass? That shit is cheap, and it's like it'll say like Grandma of the Year, and it's like pink, and you see it, and you're like at Home Goods, you're like, damn, who buys that? And it's like I the just point, like that you've been to Home Goods. Oh, Jewish has, grandmas. In yeah, Florida. I live in Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but but I meant like. Did you buy some doilies while you were there? Well, John, your, John doilies <laughs> but but I, but I get okay well, I get what you're saying and I and I understand this and I think that, that what you're talking about too is like can there be outliers in every group 100 percent but an outlier like just like there's a, I think I've used a plastic wine glass before I've had a use for it but overall I don't keep them in my house because I think the overall they're neither beautiful nor that durable and they don't serve a great purpose but there was a time when I needed them and so some people are outliers and can serve their own purpose in specific areas but we're talking about overarching themes that make a stronger society and I think women poising more into the into the into the feminine and getting more into who that is to be somebody who's a nurturer somebody who is empathetic somebody who is and again you're a lesbian you might you you already are an outlier just being a lesbian like you're just mm -hmm. your sexuality so it's like if that doesn't apply to you then it, it may not and that and no, it may I, never I, I you think, know what i mean no i think it does i think i'm very nurturing i'm, I'm if you believe in astrology some people that watch no i think do. you are too you're hug i'm i'm, you I'm came very, very huggy girly. i'm yeah. very mm -hmm. very feminine but i i also maybe you're in the same soul pod maybe that's what that is i don't know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what is he were you an aries aren't you like well, an aries? let me, yeah. let me, let me, found let me throw you're something aries, in right? i just found it out let me throw something in I here real quick that. because what we're having here is an emotional discussion rather than a rational discussion okay? i don't think so no we are because I don't what, think so. what you're stating your presumptions are that men and women we both have these emotional states and we need to develop these emotional states i will I'll tell you right now that's bullshit okay for for men and women for a biological fact between men and women men and women process emotions differently yes, simply because of true. our neural wiring yes. okay that's true so when somebody says get in touch uh, get in touch with your feminine side or i can't believe that you didn't cry during titanic because you're a guy and you it, you didn't that move you to tears no it didn't because i don't process emotion the same way that a woman that's very does true. That's and very so true. what we're doing right now is we're trying to force fit men but like reprogram us our social learning, you know, into uh, a, a female correct way of doing things. So the correct way to emote is like a woman emotes and guys are not built for that because we simply don't have the same neurological wiring for that. But we'll go and we'll say, well, because you can't do that, there's something very, very wrong with you. Mm -hmm. You must be emotionally stunted. You must not be able to get in touch with your emotions. If you were, you'd be more like a chick. You'd be more like a woman if you could just if you could just do that. But the problem is, is like if we're going to say, well, we're both all blank slates and we both have the same capacity for emotion and we both have the same capacity for reason and whatever else. When we don't include our biological differences that predispose us to that emotion is not fucking magic. It is not like some magic angel dust that, uh, that no, it's, it's drops it's down from heaven. It's hormonal and chemical. It is hormonal and chemical. It is an 100%. interpretive process. So when you see something, you, you see the saber tooth tiger and you have that it, adrenaline rush, you get fight or flight. You feel something right there mm -hmm. and right then and there. For men, we tend to, we tend to default to anger women tend to default to like crying or being upset you know it's the the vulnerable sex versus the the sex that is really the disposable sex but we don't process emotion that's just one aspect of masculinity and femininity that is a conventional fact 
but yet we still want to have this woo woo magical thinking about things and say, well, we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to pretend that this Jungian psychology where we have a female side and a, and a, and a male in a male side, and you're a stunted guy. If you can't find some sort of balance, you're already trying working against your own innate biology to do that in the first place. So I, I, th I agree that's why that. we have such a problem. We have gendered ideas about things like strength. That's why I was asking about that. What is your fucking idea of strength? What is what is that defined as? Is it physical strength? Well, is it that's, like why mental strength? that's why I asked what, him. That's why I asked him. What does it come about, down to? Right. And in a female correct society, it's always going to be oh, you got to be vulnerable and you got to be right. uh, you have to have all, you get more in touch. A, 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 a strong man is the guy who is more like a woman and a strong woman who is more like a man. Imagine that. Well, I, I am interested, though. How do you like that? Like that? How is that? What is this crap? Who listens to this guy? He's got a ponytail. Oh, who's going to talk? Who, who cares what this guy has to say? <laughs> Let me tell you something, man. Tradcons in the in the chat. You guys are mercenary. You guys are ruthless. Uh, I, I, I got an education in, um, I guess, uh, Tradcon thinking or trad controlling because uh, wow. <laughs> uh, this was from me uh, this, just this week. If you haven't already watched it, uh, this is a clip that I pulled from, uh, excuse me, my second show on uh, You Are Here with uh, Elijah Schaefer. They hosted me out there and the the other uh, brunette there is Sydney and the, uh, the girl next to me, um, that is Ariella Scar, I, I'm going to butcher her last name, Scarcella or Scarciella or something like that. And <clears throat> excuse me, I had no idea who Ariella was when I ran in, when I went in. Okay. Excuse me, Devil Mountain Coffee. <clears throat> so I went in and um, I, not knowing what to expect, but man, I, I got into the studio and she was, she's, by the way, but as, as great as that was, whatever. Um, she's a very nice girl, very nice, very understanding and everything else. But, uh, you know, you know, off camera, everything was just don't uh, trust me. Look at the pictures. Everything was cool. But I had no idea what I was getting into. When I, when I got in there, I was like, where have I seen this girl before? And then I realized I'd seen her on Tim pool. And, uh, then I'm like, ah, okay. Now, now I know where I'm at. And I, the reason I chose that as sort of my, my clip of the day, um, is because, um, we got to a point where um, where the conversation was revealed, right? The, the the context of the conversation was rationalism versus emotionalism. And once I had, once you, um, or if you watch the rest of that video, by the way, and I I totally encourage you to do so. I realize it's long; it's like a two hour thing. I I did I did um, one uh, solo interview on um, let's see, it was Wednesday of last week. And then I also did uh, this one on Thursday. And then I'm also on slightly offensive with Elijah Schaefer, which is sort of his sort of, you know, jeans and t-shirt show. It's not a, it, it's, it's, you know, let your hair down kind of thing. And that was a really, really, uh, if, if I would count that amongst um, like interviews, I would say that's probably one of my top interviews. I really enjoyed that conversation. And Elijah's a great guy. Um, I hope I can work with him again because um, he, he and I really kind of clicked, uh, especially, excuse me, conversationally, we really kind of clicked. And so uh, in case you don't know who Ariella is, she has an OnlyFans. She is a lesbian. Um, that that Brooklyn accent is for real. Um, she is about four foot. I, I'm going to, maybe she's five. Maybe she's five foot. I'm four foot 11. <laughs> she, she's a short girl. She's cute. Um, but she is a, a darling, I think, or starting to become a darling of like trad cons because she speaks the right language. But uh, when I'm on there, and as you guys know, I've done this before several times um, on Fresh and Fit. I've done this on uh, other shows as well. Once we get to a point of a conversation where we start talking about um, the law of attraction, the secret, right, or uh, MBTI or astrology or tarot cards or chick, any name the chick crack. Once we get to that point, then I know where I am. And prior to this, she was kind of talking over me a little bit. I'm like, okay, fine. I remember, guys, remember when I was doing the Pat Campbell show and I was trying to come up with some things that, you know, I remembered about Pat Campbell. And I told you about that one incident where I was on uh, his show uh, in on his radio show. 
and uh, we had a lesbian, not lesbian, <laughs> we had a feminist call in and she was reading me the riot act and, and everything else. And I raised my voice and I kind of lost my shit a little bit. Right. And that was the first time I think I had ever got, uh, got, got someone had got an emotional rise out of me for, for whatever reason, just simply because I could not get a word in edgewise. And right after that, as the story goes, uh, as soon as that show was over, Pat calls me up and he says, he says, you lost your cool. He says, that's th this, let this be a lesson to you. And it was, as I said, you know, Pat is one of my mentors, but he also says that was some great radio <laughs> and it was, it was some really great radio, but, uh, I remembered that. I remembered that from the show that I was, I just did back in what October, November when I did uh, Pat's memorial show. So I'm like, Ah, lesson learned. I'll let uh, sometimes all you have to do is allow people to you know give them enough rope, right? Give them enough rope, uh, let them speak their piece, and once they do, uh, open up on them, and that's exactly what I did. So, uh, my my point in all of that, by the way, was trying to establish a separation in conversation. Now, you've heard me say this before. I've told Myron this on, on several occasions that you get to a point when you are arguing or debating or even just discussing. This was a really actually a very great good discussion. Nobody really got, you know, like in, in each other's grill or nobody walked off the stage or anything. Nobody got castled. Right. Um, so it, it was a good it was a good debate. But the problem is, is that when you have a good debate and you start talking about, you know, rational logic versus uh, what you say here? <laughs> this is pretty good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, once once you get to that point, once I hear astrology, once I and earlier in that uh, in that conversation, I, I didn't include it in this clip, but earlier in that conversation, she said something about like the law of attraction and it's a law and it's real. And I'm just like, OK, now I know where I'm at. I'm, I have my roadmap. <laughs> I know where I'm at. And you've heard me say this before. I'm um, just finishing that thought uh, when I've talked to Myron about this, when you when a woman gets to the point where she has no real rational counter argument you uh, it's the the channel is this alton it is um it's called uh, the the name of the show is you are here uh i've i put <laughs> if you follow this channel you should have seen it I've, i made several posts on it in the community so go you can go check it out it's called you are here elijah schaefer uh sydney watson are the hosts of it uh it's a it's an up-and-comer um their 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 engagement is crazy good uh, they are a Blaze affiliate channel, so uh, be prepared for guys like Glenn Beck and you know other attachments to that as well, if that's your thing. Um, but uh, they're they're getting they're very popular right now, and uh, I know that uh, Elijah has been on uh, Tucker Carlson on a few occasions, and I know he has worked for the Blaze as sort of like a reporter for a while. Um, but this is his this is his show um, and Sydney's as well. And then he has his own solo show called Slightly Offensive. So those are the two. Go have go have a look at those. But as I said, when I get to that point in the debate, that's when I know I have to sort of shift gears. I'm either going to hit back or I'm just going to go. OK, point of diminishing returns, as I've said before, when a woman gets to the point where she has no counter argument and she says, who hurt you? Right. Or astrology, this. Or, you know, my my therapist said that, you know, um, there is even merchandise merch. Right. Whenever a woman says I feel on Fresh and Fit, then that's that's pretty much where, you know, you know, you're going to be at. And it's real easy to see that on, let's just say, uh, Ratchet Ho Thought Shows, Ratchet Ho Thought Shows, four doors, more horse. Right. Um, it's real easy to, to see that in, you know, sort of salacious um, uh you know, YouTube formulaic, let's just say, you know, get the girls on and talk about it. It's easy when you have girls coming in like 15 at a time every day, but it's not so easy when you're on there, you know, one-on-one -on -one with someone like, with someone like Ariel, 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 I can't remember her name, um, who, like I said, has, she's got a lesbian only fans. I didn't even think that existed. And then I went and looked her up by the way, and she's like pushing like a million subs as well and i did not realize just how popular she was but she's like she's kind of like popular in the same way that rose mcgowan is kind of picking up in in popularity with uh like right wing trad cons right now it's like they want some little darling and i think she's i wouldn't say she's that but uh if you speak the right language all of a sudden then you know you become you become part of their tribe so 
Uh, I want to, so I want to throw that out there because today's topic is actually not all women are like that. And the reason why I started with that is because essentially the conversation we're going to have today is the difference between rationalism and emotionalism, old order thinking versus new order thinking. And I'm going to float this one out there right at the beginning of this shoe. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I think that old order thinking versus new order thinking is blue pill versus red pill. And I have been in intersexual dynamics for a very long time. I'm not changing. I'm, that's still my wheelhouse. I'm not changing. I'm not switching up anything. So don't think that this is any, you know, <laughs> this is not my move, my, my pivot to something else. Uh, however, um, as I've said before, and I think this is probably more obvious in relationship and, you know, intersexual dynamics and game and the red pill being red pill aware, as we all know, it's been something I've talked about for 20 years now. Uh, whether it was on So Suave or wherever else, I think it was easier to sort of understand that separation or that sort of awakening, I guess. Um, and I hate to even put it in those terms because then it sounds really nebulous and really sinister, but it's like sort of this new understanding of what we thought of as our old order ego investments versus the new order and our data and our stats right now. And I think that we still want to cling to that emotionality. We still want to cling to the old order things that felt good. And if you saw my, uh, my, I guess it was a, my pre-record on Wednesday of this week, um, I did that specially for you because I knew I'd be on the plane. And I talked about uh, Stardust and uh, what, Thinking, Thinking Ape, I think is what his title of his show or his channel is called. And I sort of picked apart the what I thought was sort of my, my counter argument, let's just say, to the idea that the blue pill is, you know, staying stuck in the matrix is a, a good thing because by and large, most men aren't ready to be unplugged from the matrix. Most men aren't ready to have their old order magic dispelled for them. They're not ready to have um, to have the. Uh, to, to see the the man behind the curtain, like the great Wizard of Oz. They're not ready to see the machinations. There's your vocabulary word today, children. They're not ready to see how the sausage gets made. They just want to eat the sausage. And I I think I'm I'm probably gonna I, I don't want to do a disservice to to Stardust guy. Actually, just go watch that that video, but I'm just gonna try to sum it up a little bit here. My my point in all of that was that you can't help it. They're, they're unplugging regardless of whether or not it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. It's happening. The genie's out of the bottle. You know, he made this analogy of how it was like, you know, what was it, uh, peanut allergies. And if everybody, if 85% of guys had a peanut allergy, then you wouldn't suggest that people have peanuts, right? We'd make them illegal or whatever. And the fact remains that, P that, first of all, it's a bad analogy. And then second of all, it, it doesn't matter because everybody has peanuts in their mouth right now. <laughs> they all, I don't know, allergy or not, they, that's what they're consuming. And this is pervasive right now. It is pervasive in popular culture. It's pervasive throughout the, the certainly the manosphere, which has been for a long time. But now it's expanding to other spheres like this, just like the, the conservative sphere, just like the, the financial entrepreneurship side. Robert Kiyosaki, good example. Robert Kiyosaki, before March of this year, I, I, you know, I knew rich dad, poor dad, but that was about it. Right? But I had no idea that Robert Kiyosaki was sort of having his own awakening. And that was, you know, I'm going to gloss myself a little bit here, but it's because he was reading my book. Great. Reached out to me. I started talking to him and then we developed sort of this, you know, back and forth friendship, I guess. And I've had him on and I will still continue to talk to him. I'll also, I was just on his show. Uh, let's see, it would have been the first week of December. So you can go ahead and check that out as well. Go look at uh, Rich Dad Radio or Rich Dad uh, Podcast. Uh, it's on YouTube. I've linked it several times. Uh, there's, I've actually have some clips of it right now too. So if you're interested in that, but that's another example of what's going on right now. This is like this, I hate to call it the great awakening or something like that, or the great unplugging maybe, but people outside the manosphere, people outside our red pill sphere of influence are asking questions. They're hell. They're using this as, as great 
fodder for podcast material for, for topics. This is awesome, right? I mean, they're, they're just like, oh, great. Uh, well, and, and the problem with the, this sort of, un, I guess, awakening, this unplugging, the great unplugging, maybe we should call it that, right? Is that it's really hard for a lot of guys. So in some ways, I kind of agree with, with Stardust that, yeah, men aren't ready to be unplugged. But here, ready or not, here we come. Ready or not. You can't, you can't avoid it. You, it's unavoidable. And I think, uh, you know, there's this right now I'm seeing this push, I think, in in popular culture, at least online culture anyways, it, to sort of you know, go on a social media diet. Right? You know, don't don't take everything on, on Twitter so seriously. And we can't really get away with it. You have to remember that like social media is designed, fundamentally designed to keep you locked in. I mean, they have if you know anything about um, about, uh, let's see. I guess it would be Twitter, maybe Tinder's probably like this too. Uh, if you look at any kind of social media that is like a constant update kind of social media, like fa Facebook, I you know, if you are following me on Facebook and you think, oh gosh, Rollo really doesn't you know use Facebook. I I do. I, I look at things. I kind of lurk on Facebook, but I don't see it as sort of like this. I'll say addictive, but this kind of like continual like thing that I keep looking at. Uh, TikTok definitely for a younger generation certainly is, you know, oh, well, how do we update, right? Let's scroll, um, doom scrolling, right? Through Twitter. Uh, Instagram is, is a big deal too, of course. And it's like, who said what? What's the next story? What's the, uh, you know, new posts? Click, zip, and goes right back up. If you know anything, I think that's, um, there's a great documentary. It was on Netflix, but it's, uh, I think it's called uh, The Social Dilemma. That's what it's called. And the social dilemma is will will reveal kind of like the psychological mechanics behind all of that. And it's very similar to, and I, I know this from experience because I've worked for these companies, it's very similar to um, like video poker or or online gambling or video, like if you ever go to the, you know, the casinos here in Reno or down in Las Vegas, you ever been to like a, a casino and you see these, you know, you're wondering why these people are sitting there just you know, constantly, you know, pressing all they're doing is like it's almost like rats you know trying to get the reward you know like a skinner box or something like that you know but that's by design those machines are there to keep you doing that in fact uh the scrolling uh aspect of twitter and and really i guess uh instagram and having that constant kind of like dialogue box that comes up or you see that little red uh updates oh there's seven people have updated this or god forbid you have like notif notifications on your on your iPhone or whatever your device is um, that tells you something is updated. But the mechanics of that is meant to be addicting in the same way that, uh, you know, gambling addicts get off on sort of like just little low level dopamine hits when, when there's something new. And again, the, the act of like hitting the little, you know, button on the video poker or the video slot machine or whatever in the casinos is very similar to when you're when you're doing uh when you're scrolling you're doom scrolling and it has the same kind of effect it's, I, I would say I'm, i won't get too much into that but it, it the point is this uh, do go see the uh the documentary by the way if you are curious it's uh, called the social dilemma but um the the point is this is that we can't get away from that and it's by it's by design and so when you are away from that for a little while you go Oh, you know, after a while, I think there's something sort of in your subconscious or maybe in your hind brain that says, I want to go see, oh, wonder what's going on in the world today. What fresh hell awaits me? Um, and so you can't get away from that. And especially if your interest is your reproductive problem. So you tie that sort of gambling addiction, psychological, I mean, they hire psychologists to make it more addicting at Facebook and these other and Google and such. They that that's by design. Now pair that with your, your reproductive problem and your inability to solve it. Pair that with, um, pair that with the frustration that m more men than women actually have to deal with because men are the ones who are expected to have you know, burden of performance, but we're also expected to be the initiators. And so there's an app for that. There's an app for everything. And all of those apps are designed to keep you locked in. And when we pair that up with this sort of great unplugging right now, expecting people to take a, a, uh, you know, a, a diet, you know, go on your social media diet is, is, is ridiculous. It's, it's as ridiculous as expecting people to go, you know what, I'm going to give up Taco Bell. 
I'm going to give up the, you know, my, my, my fast food addiction or my ease, my convenient, my, you know, my, my comfort food addiction. It's, it's along those lines. Anyways, I'm going to say it's exactly like that. Um, what'd you say here? Costa, let me throw something. I want to catch up here. Finally caught your stream. Oh, thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. And then I did have one more. Sam Bada is in the chat. Uh, I'm Shamishi is in the chat. So those are my two mods today. I don't see Torsha anywhere. Um, what'd you say? Oops, wait a minute. Sorry. Uh, sometimes at a time of trauma, it does come to down to a binary choice, unplug or keep your day uh, for self deletion. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about that today too, by the way, uh, blue pill unplug dude. And I have to go back up a little further now that I can get to unlimited. Gosh, you guys are crazy today. Oh, Telly. Hi, my favorite troll. Uh, patriarchy makes good women. Religion also helps. Uh, patriarchy is actually a, an innate evolved social order that we're kind of subverting right now. So, uh, Rolla, what is it with women who say you don't respect women? <laughs> Go look at the respect show, my friend, because women have a different, uh, there are gendered uh, differences, de de gendered concepts in, re uh, in respect. I actually did a full episode on that. Oh, there we go. Caught, caught up. There you are, Nick. Uh, where can I find a collection of all your sources online? Well, uh, I, you, would you like me to, to throw out um, uh, a links uh, thing? On? I, can, I can do that. You want me to do that on... Um, I've done this before, by the way. I have put out um, links in as comments in some of my videos before. Um, to do so, I, it, it kind of depends on what you're specifically looking for. Um, I, I should actually do that. I, I could give you a whole bunch of like sort of interesting links and statistics that you can go look up, um, Nick. But uh, it, it, it would be easier for me to do that by topic, I think, because I, I think you guys probably you're probably asking this because you read the book. Um, when I did uh, book four religion, um, I was very meticulous in my data sets. I had to be because I knew I was like trying to appeal to an audience that was broader than just the manosphere. I wanted to appeal to a religious audience so we could have these conversations. And of course, that was a mistake because nobody wants to have these conversations because it's a it's a fundamental challenge to ego investments. Uh, as and remember, it's not just religion. It's also things like astrology and the secret and the and mbti and whatever of whatever your sort of pseudo spirituality is it doesn't have to be a religion even i'm religious but or i'm i'm spiritual but not religious sure you are uh what'd you say let's catch up uh with xmas <laughs> That would be Christmas, my friend. Uh, coming up, how do you suggest we deal with blue pill conditioning of the family without losing your shit on them? Whole family is super BP. Uh, learned to pick your battles. Ask questions. Ask. Lead the witness, my friend. That's the best way to do it, Mr. Steel Yo Helium. Steel Yo Helium. That's the best way to do it. I hate to say it, but it's like Socratic method. You ask the questions to lead the witness in the direction that you want them to go at least in the direction that you want them to contemplate, let's just say. I'm not saying you're trying to get, get, get in their head and turn, you know, turn the key. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you lead them with questions and say, why do you think that? Where did you come up with that? Why, why, how do you think you came into that belief? That's the easiest way, I think. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, I'm speaking from perspective of intersexual dynamics. If you need another mod, let me know. Okay. Um, I possibly do. I've got three mods on this. Well, actually, I got more than that. I got the guys from Rule Zero, too. But they don't come in mod. They don't care about me. They don't really care about me. Nobody, nobody cares. <laughs> I need that sound drop. <clears throat> nice work this week. Thank you. Uh, what's the story behind the firearms in the boat? Oh, okay. <laughs> you guys don't know that? You guys, Come on, man. The, the, okay, so here's the, the thing is you're never supposed to talk about at least online anyways. If, if the, the feds are listening, you're, you're never supposed to, and you'll, you'll notice this about me. I guess I should throw this out there. I, don't, I never talk about firearms on my show, on this show. Um, do I own them? Yes, I do. But I'm not going to go and show you pictures of them. I'm not going to show you my, my cool Vortex Strike Eagle scope either. Um, well, three hundred dollars on it, um, but I, I, I do. I own them, but I don't want people to know that I own them. 
and I'm not a gun, I'm not a gun guy per se. I do go to the range. My, my father-in-law, my father-in-law is definitely a gun guy. Um, but, uh, I do that on purpose because I, I, I don't, first of all, I don't think it's relevant to anything that I talk about on here. And second of all, um, if somebody comes to my house and they're, you know, they, they think I'm unarmed. I want them to think that I want you to that. seriously <laughs> come. I, I want you to think that. I mean, that's it, the element of surprise, right? So there's that. But what's the joke? The joke is that I'm surprised you guys don't know this um, because this is the I'm trying to remember where I heard this from. But that's what you're supposed to say is if you think the feds are listening, you go, yeah, I have guns, but I lost them in a tragic boating accident. And they're at the bottom of a lake. That what that means, that's like code for I still might have them. And it's it's uh, it's supposed to be against like them tracking you and saying that you have like like you're a gun nut or something like that. and You've got guns in the house. That's really what it comes down to. That's why it's that's why it's supposed to be funny. If you have to explain a joke, is it funny? No, it's not. Uh, You're the man, bro. I just found your content recently. Only wish I had found it before it was too late. Yes. And the the other thing that's funny is this. I mean, one last gun gun joke really quickly here. I. (laughs) Like when people go, never, here's, I, I told Elijah this too. I said, there's two things that you never want to talk about on the internet, guns and martial arts. Those are, those will generate more troll posts than any other topic, right? Because as soon as you say, oh yeah, I look like an AR, right? Ha, he doesn't know it was a nine millimeter, you know, a, it, that's not an assault rifle. Right? AR doesn't even mean assault rifle. Right? Let me tell you something. And everybody is an expert. Everyone is an expert, right? Hell, this is it right here. They'll go. They will spend half an afternoon just to fit, to show you like how wrong you were. And oh man, who could take you seriously? You don't know anything about guns. No, dude, I I do. And I was throwing that out there in the middle of a conversation where I'm trying where there's back and forth going on. Okay, they, oh you got me. Okay, you got me. That, that, congratulations, you win. <laughs> I, I'll just leave it at that. The other thing is like martial arts because like people go, well, you know, I do, um, uh, I've practiced Kali for a while and I never really talk about that because I know the minute I do, they'll go, man, that sucks. How are you going to use that? You know? And then it'll be like, you need to learn Krav Maga or what? name it, just name it. And you will have a, an endless debate as to what's more effective and what's not. So I, I tend to stay away from those topics and that's why, because there's too many, too many experts, right? Too many experts. Everybody knows. Everybody knows something about something. What'd you say, Brian? Brian says, well, what do you think? This is, this is my accent when I come back from Texas. Everybody, you know, I'll tell you what's funny is when I was in Oklahoma, I saw more cowboy hats in Oklahoma than I did in Texas. I almost feel like disappointed. Uh, I want to say thank you, and uh, we'll keep contributing to your work as much as I can. Uh, will you have another Q and A? When is your next book coming out? Yeah. Do you want me to have another Q and A? I'll tell you why. I did, I did a Q and A. Um, I did a Q and A on Fresh and Fit when I was out there uh, the beginning of this month, um, and that was good. Uh, the best part of it, by the way, was uh, talking to Mike Rashid. And if you've seen my clips channel recently, there's a clip of that of that discussion when he called in because I was doing Q and A, and he called and we talked, and it was great. Was was one of the most. It was an adult conversation. Imagine that on, and, and no one cares, and, and no engagement. <laughs> no one wants to watch that. They don't want to see that. They don't want to see contrition, and they don't want to see. Uh, they want to see fights. Um, but uh, it was actually a really good conversation, and I am hoping and looking forward to possibly uh, doing uh, a one-on-one with him at some point in the future. So we'll see. Uh, when is the new book coming out? Probably January. Uh, only because I've been busy with other things like going to Texas and going to Miami and going to Oklahoma. And soon I will be going back to Houston again. So you guys got no idea. You, do you know? I give and I give and I give. <laughs> what is the best way to use social media? Um, as sparingly as possible. And some people will say just unplug, just don't even use it at all. Well, I think that's impossible. I think there's got to be some sort of happy medium there. And what that is, I think we're still experimenting with. Leo Stone, thank you for that. Uh, I think you meant to put this there. How to train yourself to process emotions correctly as a man. I'm glad you said that. Um, Leo, we're going to get to that. That's actually what today's main topic is really about. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Telly, we're going back. Don't worry. Yeah. Hold, cool your titties. Um, If you're still on top of the dirt instead. Okay, great. 
All right, here we go. Oh, man. Oh, man. Let's see. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. Here we go. All right, I'm going to back up here in just a second. I, I don't have a gun. I'm just a regular ordinary guy from Montana. They don't have accents there, do they? Uh, Mr. Middlepath made a vid on red pill and Nazi alt. Uh, 1938 Germans uh, from the alt right are same. Uh, yeah, well, we're gonna we can discuss that as well because they are definitely not the same. I don't know what checklist of Locky and one thousand bucks is, but that is a very generous contribution if it's red. I think is it Czechoslovakia? CZK is Czechoslovakia, right? Hey, Rello, more than a year ago, I found you. Thanks for, oh, you know what? You, there you go. Dom Monko, Monko. You. you guys hate that, don't you? <laughs> That's why I do it. Um, I found you guys uh, all your, not, thank you for all your knowledge and material. It really opened my eyes and killed the blue pill. Alpha, I was right now. I ended up in it, ended up top 10 in international male pageant. Is there? international uh and living a great life no explanation needed thank you again okay well i won't explain i won't try to explain it then um i already got you uh leo but thank you for your contributions my friend uh okay and let me these are i'll get two more and that's it and we'll get back uh dung is fun really I've noticed this about every relationship. There's always a sub and a dom. Wow, con congratulations. You've just quoted uh, two of my, uh, some my actually no, some of my favorite essays, a top and a bottom. And every relationship's gay, straight, lesbian. What I've noticed is that you're the le if you're the lesser one, you have more power by law. Um, yes and no. But primarily, if you're, if <laughs> we have a, gosh, I should, I'm going to, I need to do a full show on this, but there is actually a psychological, um, Let's see, um, say convention. Let's just say it's called the Women Are Wonderful Convention, and then pretty much anything that women say, we sort of take with a little bit more uh, sympathy or gravity, or you know, um, we take it. We 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 tend to rate women higher just because they are women. Um, it's very actually has been studied really since like the early or mid '90s, I think. I should talk about that sometime. I'm, I'm planning, by the way, on doing a show about uh, Dr. David Buss and that video he just did. And I can't remember the other guy who was the interviewer. I have that actually all on tap. But this, I felt, was a little bit more important today. Uh, it doesn't matter that not all women are like that. It's that too many of them are. That's the one modifier no one can reasonably disagree with. One or a trillion, it's all too many. Okay, we will get to that today, too. Um... That's coming up. Uh, Rolo is the statement, not all women are like that, connected with the social constructionism and blank slate equalism. Yes, and we will get to that today as well, my friend. Thank you for that. You guys are, uh, man, I, man, here, where is it? There it is. Hello there, children. How's it going? Welcome to class, children. I'm glad you are paying attention and taking notes. I looked up divorce stats worldwide. I'm glad because I got lots of them today and found out that Islamic countries have a similar divorce rates to the West. The Maldives uh, has a divorce rate of 11% per 1,000. It doesn't matter what religion is. All that matters is red pill versus blue pill. Yes, you are correct in that. Um, and last but not least, would you say your view is more agnostic or uh, <laughs> uh, or more than a few like agnostic theist, uh, agnostic theist? Uh, I can answer that with a very simple statement, and that is go buy book four and read the very last chapter and you'll understand what I, my faith is. Um, let's see. Will P, P will single mom, uh, long-term relationship. I know bad idea since I am competing, com completing her mating strategy. Would it make sense for me to be able, uh, be able to complete mine uh, and be able to sleep with other women? Will this affect the beta need? Okay. Um, get out. There you go. That's my advice to you. Your $20, you knew, you're asking for advice or permission. Here's my permission and my advice. Get the fuck out. <laughs> Get out. Get out. Somebody, somebody give me that sound drop from Amityville Horror where it's like, Get out. Do you guys remember? I guess you remember Amityville Horror, do you? Uh, why does Morgan Stanley know about the marriage trend? How does they? How do they know? How does they know? Does Morgan Stanley have analysts that watch your show? Probably not, but they have some smart people there. They're very smart monkeys. 
at Morgan Stanley. John Holt. Thank you, John Holt. Okay, this is it. Do you plan on addressing a clip of Little House Phone from No Jumper Roasting Fresh, essentially calling him a fake alpha? Uh, do you want me to? Do I have to? Last time I did that, you guys were like, hey, are you going to talk about fresh and da 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 da? You're going to react? Um, okay. <laughs> I react. Hey, you're defending fresh and fit. <laughs> How do you must have a bias? You asked me to respond. That's what I did. <laughs> Uh, and the whole thing, by the way, about the copyright stuff, we'll see how that unfolds. But honestly, I think that's on either side. I think that unless there's unless there's you see some traction between either one of those people or any of those factions. Yeah. Thanks. For, thanks for watching. <laughs> thanks for watching, guys. <laughs> that's all I can say. I, I want to get on to some of this other stuff today, though, because I will get into uh, I, I want to talk about um, this. I, somebody sent me this video of Hafiz from The Roommates, and I know he's my favorite you know, whipping boy here. But uh, again, as I was stating before, I think we are at a point right now of the great unplugging where the guys who aren't ready to be unplugged, as Stardust was saying, th those guys who have channels who are in the hustle economy, who are still kind of, I don't know, um, let's just say invested, ego invested, emotionally invested in that old order way of thinking. That old order way of thinking, by the way, represents a solution to the problem that they all experience or they tend to experience. Or they think, or they think that other people can find a solution or can live a better life or it fits in with whatever their particular uh, branding is, whatever their wheelhouse happens to be. They believe, and I'm, and I'm using that word intentionally, they believe that if you stick to this old order way of thinking that you'll find some sort of resolution to your problem. Now, I've used the roommates as, a, as an example before. Once again, I don't know these guys personally. I know I, I, this is not a personal attack, but this is really, I, I, I can't help but see this as really being an illustration of what's going on in a larger, in a larger sense right now. So not all women are like that is old order thinking. That's an old order solution that doesn't work in an age where we have constant social media that we are are are, are consuming whatever it happens to be. And by the way, like I said, that just because we work here, I work here, I work in the the manosphere does not mean that other spheres don't do exactly the same damn thing. <laughs> They, they start, they consume the same thing and they keep going over and over and over again. You want to know how we get that polarization between like ideologies and genders and, and religions and everything else. Uh, you know, when what's left versus right, uh, you know, red versus blue, whatever you want to call it. Um, that is, it, it's, it, it spans lots and lots of, you know, on, online internet subcultures. So bear that in mind as I am sort of picking my way through this. Um, because I think that, you know, uh, Hafiz is a, he's a good example. He's an easy example. And the, the fact that he actually interviewed Rob Henderson, who I have a great deal of respect for, and I think he's a great writer, uh, Rob, if you're watching this again, this is no, no, no attack on him either. Um, I actually subscribe to, uh, I, well, I followed him on Twitter for forever. And I also subscribe to his Substack as well. Cause I like what he has to say. And I think he's an insightful guy. Uh, he knows this stuff he knows these answers and as you guys have heard me say on this show countless times um there are certain evolutionary psychologists i would put i would put uh now in class certainly have in the past in, well, i would include david buss in that list i would include um certainly jordan peterson certainly um uh, dr warren farrell uh certainly dr stephen pinker um, there's a lot of guys who i think are really smart dudes it's just that they are either unable or unwilling to connect the dots that I do or connect the dots that other people are doing. And they just simply don't, you know, they'll, they'll give you the data and they're great re resources for data, but interpreting that data is biased by what they, you know, what their old order thinking is, what their blue pill thinking is, what their conditioning is. They won't go there as a, I think it was, I've, I've used this quote on several, actually in two books that I can think of now. Uh, Nick Krauser, old PUA guy, I mean, <laughs> classic PUA and another guy I have a lot of respect for. He once said that PUA and sort of relationship, whatever, you know, game has in 15 years has done more to 
educate or has, has, has produced more information on intersexual dynamics and, and dating and gender relations than the hundred of years, the hundreds of years that came before well, the hundred years that came before it through traditional psychology or even sociology, because those guys are out there in the field trying to see if this works. It doesn't we'll come back and we, we read just, and we go out there. It's hypothesis. It's really the scientific method when you think about it. Now we don't think of PUAs as being, you know, like mm, wearing a lab coat with, you know, a little <laughs> pen protector in it. But guys went out there and now here we are 20, 21 years into the 21st century and the data sets are there. And that rubs a lot of these guys the wrong way. Because if you're a guy like, if you're, if you're a clinical psychologist, let's just say, and I have to sort of preface this. And again, this is no attack on Rob Henderson. Um, or anyone else for that matter. But I, I do under, I have to you have to call out the dynamic here. If you are a clinical psychologist who went, you know, eight to 10 years and getting your degree, and then you either went into a private practice or you decided you were going to teach, then you've got to, I don't know how long you have to do to get your tenure. Uh, you have a lot invested in yourself and you have a lot invested in what you think should be the right way to go about being a psychologist, a, a well-educated psychologist with a degree on the wall and your doctor, you know, the DR in front of your name. <clears throat> and then you go and you see a guy like John from Modern Life Dating. <laughs> and you see him in a Captain America outfit, right? <laughs> and that guy is making more money than, than those guys after 10 years in college or private practice. And he's there because he's connecting dots that they can't. They are either unwilling or unable to connect. And so... I, I think that in the hustle economy right now, certainly certainly religion is in the hustle economy and certainly psychology is in the hustle economy right now. So when you say like a guy who's been to school for like eight or 10 years and someone like Rolla Tomasi rolls around with a, you know, I got a bachelor in, you know, psychology. And I'm, I've been doing this for, like I said, for 20 years, writing about this stuff and just exploring it and I have access to the same data he does. I'm just I'm hell he is the data half the time right i mean th those guys anyways and i can see how that would get pretty offensive i can see how that people would want to disqualify that oh well you're not a you're not an, an accredited source okay but i'm quoting you who is an accredited source and i am just asking questions and pushing this stuff out there i'm not giving advice i'm just saying here's what it is i'm connecting dots am i wrong because i'd like to have that conversation <laughs> but we don't have that conversation because people want to take this information and they want to like ruin themselves with it or they think that they're ruining themselves with it because it conflicts with what they think should work in their old order way of thinking. And that's really the conflict that I had with Ariella because her solution is oh, it's all about love. It's all about emotion. It's all about, uh, you know, I think I think men can be just as feminine as women and women can be just as masculine as men. That right there for the last I know since the sexual revolution, certainly since like 1965, really maybe 55, 60 years. That's why we're where we're at right now. So we'll complain and 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 grind our teeth over, you know, these social issues and degeneracy and people are in the church and we need to make more babies. And we you know, was it Elon Musk. We got to have more children. And we'll, we, we're seeing the results and the products of all that. But we're only seeing like the, the symptoms of the disease. And we won't go back to the root and we won't talk about that because that doesn't taste good, but we're going to, we're definitely going to. And, and, and this, uh, the for exchange that I used in the beginning of today's show, we're definitely going to have that conversation because I'm going to be the one that smashes it in your face, first of all. And then second of all, it doesn't even need to be me doing it. You're going to do it to yourself. The, this generation, uh, like I said, the last half of the millennials, certainly Gen Z and whatever generation that comes after Gen Z, they are, it's going, the, the truth, the, the stats, the, everything is unavoidable, but yet we're like, Oh no, no. Like we want our safety blanket of our emotionalism. We want that safety blanket of that old order thinking. We want to go back. I, I keep telling you guys, I showed this isn't, here's a great example of this. I showed that one clip of Hugh Hefner with, uh, you know, versus the feminists back on the Dick Cavett show, which I got a copyright strike for. Thank you very much. Right. I, they're protecting their copyright like anyone else. So. When I use that as an example, I was using it because it's 1970 and it's the same language that you hear today. Exact same. For you, you'll hear it from like 25 year old women. You'll hear it from Graciela, who's like, or Graciela, <laughs> Ariella, 
who is you know, 30 years old. She, <laughs> she's only, she was born in the 80s, right? The 90s, born in the 90s. She's not from the 70s. She didn't, hell, I, I got 20 years on her. <laughs> so, but we're still using that same language. We won't go back and, and say, well, maybe something's a little off here. Because if we did that, we would be forced to go back and reassess those old order, you know, the very comforting old order, you know, psychological schema, schemas. So I'm going to show you this. Here we go. Uh, we're at the almost at the top of the hour. So I have to I have to. That was my build up. Thank you very much. Uh, is this still working? Did that come out? Oh, no, it didn't go out. I do have this. Hang on. Damn thing went to sleep on me. Hold on. See if it'll work this time. No, come on. Baby, my theater. Yeah, well, I'll figure it out later. I got a new camera in here. I shall show you in a minute. All right, I want to. Here's this is the first. This is the first point of topic here. So let's let's get into this here. Negative consequences from children being brought in broken homes, and so to me, a lot of these luxury beliefs that are being uh, you know projected into society, I see it is now destroying a lot of young men and women. Um, in regards to their personal everyday lives, in regards to having families and, and especially the lives of children. And yeah. one of the things I'm, I'm curious, because I want to definitely touch on the dating app stuff. Have you have you been seeing some of the um, the video content for for men who, who are very um, anti marriage? Have you ever seen video content and stuff like that? Is this the like the MGTOW thing? Yeah, the uh, MGTOW, like Red Pill, Manosphere, Damn. kind of that that general area of the internet that project a lot of those ideas. How are you familiar with any of it? MGTOW. I, I, I've seen some of it and and sort of have have uh, you know encountered a little of it, but I yeah I I don't really get all of it. I mean, it just seems like a lot of like I mean I I whatever like I, I guess I do feel a little pity for them, but it just seems like a lot of like sad guys who you know, had like really bad experiences, but you know, but the, yeah, this idea of like, now you're going to like go on YouTube or whatever and like talk about how no one should, like, just because you had a bad relationship means no one yeah. should have one. That kind of stuff is really, I think, pretty toxic. Yeah. And, and definitely we'll, I want to get into some of the theories to why these guys come about when we get to the dating app stuff. But one of the things to me that I, I've seen is that, you know, for a lot of Americans, you know, most people are going to have families, well, sorry, most people are going to have children, like all, like majority of people are going to have children. Mm. And from just a financial I disagree um, with you, Hafiz basis, especially as inflation and things like the things like what's happening to the economy continues. Mm. It's, it's important that, you know, there is a team effort into raising the children. And so mm. one of the things that I've seen from content like that is that there's a lot of a lot of individuals, a lot of men who are projecting these ideas, right? These ideas of, you know, you can be a guy, you can just live on your own. You can, if you want to have kids, just take care of it, you know, get, get, send a woman money, whatever the heck you're doing. And I'm looking at who just these right, beliefs right. are negatively affecting. I, I believe, uh, you know, Dr. Peterson said when the, when the rich sneeze, the, the poor get influenza during your episode oh, and um, pneumonia, I said influenza, <laughs> pneumonia. And to me, what I noticed, especially in, in the black community, a lot of these luxury beliefs within marriage affect um, those in the black community the most. So like the, the, the second wave or if not third wave feminism ideas of, you know, you don't need a man, you're it's independent, you can take care of yourself and raise your kids on your own. Yeah, maybe that works in theory. For some of them, but what happens is a lot of those in the black community, they're the ones adopting these ideas and they're and they're suffering from it. So in the same vein, I've seen that happening with a lot of the men. Like one of the biggest issues that I've talked to countless of people about this, and it's like one of the biggest things that's that's destroying American society, in my opinion, but especially the black community, is a single parent motherhood where young young men and women are not being raised with their fathers or in two parent households. Okay, so I can drop the stats on this if you want for, uh, especially when it comes to black men right now. I, I think I answered this on a couple of uh, a couple of episodes ago. Um, this is uh, he's echoing a concern, let's just say, uh, from I, I forget the name of the senator or congressman who was bringing this up. 
and black guy and he was talking about how we need more fathers in the home and we need to you know the he was trying to like make a case that you know the reason why we have such social unrest and the reason why we have these social problems right now is because we don't have masculine influences in the home which i do agree with but the problem is, is that we we conflate our stats of like parental involvement and parental investment with marriage and that's the problem so when we say, well, you know, uh, there's, you know, these single mothers, blah, blah, blah. Well, does that mean that dad is not simply hasn't married her and therefore she's a single mother? Because that's the only way we really officially recognize uh, whether there's a father in the house or not, whether it's a two parent family or not. It's based on just the fact whether the, the, the man and the woman, the, the mother and the father are married. And that's really tough to do when marriage rates are what they are i looked this up when he went uh, and this like i said is very similar to what he's saying here I, I forget the name of the congressman but i i went and i looked this up and um the the data and I, i'll go i'll go dig it up here in just a second you know i, I kind of have to like cover my ass on this but the data says this is that uh more overwhelmingly let's just say certainly since you know 2000 maybe the late 90s um, either as a result of like legal, you know, legislation, let's just say, uh, child support laws, whatever else, um, black men are actually far, far more involved with their children than they ever have in the his in the in in the past. Right now, and they say, well, how can you say that? Blah blah blah. You know, we got see, here's the divorce rate. Here's this. Yeah, but they're involved with their kids. They're just simply not married to the mom to the baby mama. Um, I forget who the the rapper was. Was it was it a rapper? I'm trying to think of a guy who has like you know seven kids from like four different wives or something like that. I think maybe that's what he's getting at. And I think that there's this want to attach this sort of you know well we have we have uh, the marriage rate is low. No one wants to get married. Um, we have this uh, the fertility rate is very low. Um, we have this higher incidence like what is it forty two percent of births? I, I mentioned this in those shows. 42% of births right now are out of wedlock. And that is even higher. In, and that's that's adjusted for like the whole country, right? It's even higher when you do, when you break it down by demographics, particularly in uh, black communities. So, you know, when women are having kids out of wedlock, it is, I, I want to say, I'm just doing this, I'm spitballing here, it's off the top of my head, it's something like 70 some odd percent in the black community uh, are, are born out of wedlock. But does that mean that dad's not around? Or does it just mean that he simply hasn't married her? Because I think that when when we conflate, again, and this is old order versus new order. We have to understand how things are, statistically speaking. So if we're going to say that we have, it's there's this crisis of, you know, fathers uh, not being in the home or so crisis of single motherhood or crisis of absentee fathers, that's, we, we, always, we always couch it in fatherless homes. Right, that's what they'll say. It's it's never single mothers who now let's remember women have will fight tooth and nail to have complete you know body autonomy. And when it comes down to pregnancy, it's not the man making the decision. In fact, he doesn't have a seat at the table. Remember, we, legislatively, you know, uh, particularly when it comes to abortion, but certainly when it comes to reproductive rights, men don't have a seat at the table until they do. Until they until they're needed to have uh, you know to, until we want to until we want to couch the information in terms of fatherless homes versus single mothers, and when we do when we actually adjust things around or we actually look at things rather than using these old order euphemisms such as fatherless homes or whatever, then we can see things in a different light. I, I mentioned this before. Uh, I th and I will mention that I will re restate this again when I do the uh, the David Bust video breakdown. But he talks about this. He makes this fundamental error that every one of these guys do. Okay, it's always well, you know, when we're talking about cuckoldry, like actual cuckoldry, when we talk about uh, you know real cuckoldry is very very rare. They'll say it's something like two to three percent or as high as ten percent. But I think that's probably it's it's very difficult to get accurate data on. On those things because we have a, an infrastructure we have a legal infrastructure that makes it almost impossible for men to discover whether or not the child is actually biologically theirs until something really goes to hell like the kid gets cancer 
or there's some sort of genetic disease or some sort of genetic you know uh, problem with that or women are going to private suppliers of sperm so that they can have a child uh, in you know in vitro fertilization then we have a problem then suddenly you know that's okay that's empowering but we have fatherless homes <laughs> And that's, and that's the choice. But as far as the cuckoldry thing is concerned, we couch it in the idea of women being married, being married, and stepping outside extramarital affair, having sex with another guy, getting impregnated by that guy, coming back to the to the marriage and telling the, the husband, hey, it's your baby. That's more or less the definition of cuckoldry for most guys who want to dance around that issue. When in fact, cuckoldry is insanely high right now absolutely high but we have to define it differently we have to say well we have single mothers and we know that 42 percent at least in the united states are born out of wedlock so we've got single mothers at that that you know 42 40 where i don't know what it's at right now but at that rate that's what i've called in the past uh, was it proactive proactive cuckoldry because what they're doing is they're looking for a guy who's going to settle down with them and take care of their kid, take care of them, another man's kid. Is that not the definition of cuckoldry? Is that not, just because there's no marriage contract involved between the two of them, is that then, is that what defines cuckoldry, a marriage contract? Or was, or is it cuckoldry in that I bred with another guy during my 18 to 28 year old, you know, hoe phase. And now that I'm 29, 30, 31 years old, and I'm looking for a guy that I, I need a stepdad, but not the step, not a stepdad, the dad who stepped up, right? We're going to ennoble these guys and say, hey, oh, you know, you guys are, are superheroes because you you wifed up a, a single mom. You see it in church. You'll see it in social. You know, you see it in media. Those, those guys are heroes because that guy was a jerk. It wasn't her decision. It wasn't about what she had done. It wasn't about the fact that she has 100% autonomous control and you have no seat at the table. But how is that not cuckoldry? How are we not defining cuckoldry like that? So if we included that and we said, okay, well, got a guy here who says, okay, well, you got a kid. I guess I'll wipe you up because if I don't, I'm not having any luck on Tinder with these single bitches. So I'm going to go and wipe up the single mommy. And this is your answer to your question, by the way. I forget who asked me this. I'm going to wipe up the single mommy. Boy, that seems like a good idea because if I do, then maybe I'll reproduce too. Like that's a, that's, that's a, a, a mating strategy in the 21st century. It's wiping up a single mom, beta male, wiping up a single mom. So if she's got, you know, She's got the the alpha's kid, and he takes care of it. Is that not cuckoldry? Yeah, you know, just because she did it, you know, before he came along, but your the the effect is still the same. The completion of a woman's mating strategy is still the same, but we don't talk about that because old order thinking predisposes us to consider that marriage is the only thing that defines cuckoldry, that defines you know a father being in the house. That's the only thing that matters. Marriage, that's the only thing. That's the number one thing that guys want to avoid because, again, it's an unconscionable contract. So now we're going to get to this point right here, and I'm going to take these guys out just for a second because this is, this, this is a big deal. Okay, When I was on Are You There? Or you are here. Are you there? <laughs> are you there? <laughs> I'm going to name my show Are You There? You are here in the chat and in the comments and everything everyone and everybody wants still to this day wants to completely disqualify anything that i had to say because i've been married for 25 years but yet he still talks about marriage like he just like i just did a minute ago right guys it's an unconscionable contract i know i'm on, i've got it myself now boy it, maybe it turned into such a thing but i don't think so i'll tell you why but you know the facts is facts right Cheaper to keep her, right? Okay. But here's the but here's the thing is they're gonna say that and they're gonna say, well, you know, that's so disqualifying. Don't listen to anything he has to say because they want that to be sort of the it what he's saying doesn't taste good. It's it it goes against my 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 emotional investments and in the idea that marriage can please Lord let it work. Oh, Pat, help me. Please let me work. It's gonna work for me because I've got divine inspiration i've got something else going for me it, 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 all those guys you know i'll take the chance no problem you know and i'm not saying you can't make marriage work you can but it's still an unconscionable contract and when people say oh well rollo said he would never get married again if he uh if he got divorced or if he was a widow or something yeah i still stick by that because i'm not against marriage 
I'm against the way we do it now. Okay. Can, can let's let's stop really quickly here. Let's put a period or a you know hand clap at the end of each one of these. I am not. I am not against marriage. I'm against the way we do it now. Got it? Can you get that through your thick fucking heads? Why is that? So, it's like a curb this fucking high. You can't get up that curb. <laughs> yes, I understand. And if anything, I think what, what really throws people off is the fact that I have a very good marriage. I've had a, I, what I think most people, most guys would consider an ideal marriage. And yes, it does require red pill awareness. Yes, it does require you to be dominant. Yes, it requires all the things that we talked about for a, you know, the, the, genetic genetic evolutionary psychological way to have a good relationship with a woman yes it qualifies for all of that and i'm still saying don't do it i've got a great marriage you want to know why i don't use myself as an example this is why man and so they say well you, you shouldn't just listen to him because he's he's shitting on marriage i am not sitting on marriage i wish god damn it i wish you guys could have a really great marriage like mine that's why i don't use my marriage as an example because I don't know that most guys can do it. In fact, I would say I would if I were to, if I were a betting man, I would say most guys can't, and most women can't. That's what I'm talking about. And it's not because I found some unicorn back in 1994, <laughs> five, somewhere around there. It's not that she, my wife was definitely not a unicorn when I met her. You know, well, things were different. Yeah, well, women were were not different. The machine was still the same. The evolutionary firmware was the same. In fact, if anything. It was more difficult back then. You know why? Because we didn't have any YouTube, man. We didn't have any of this information. We didn't have any of this education. Half the, half the guys who find my work will tell me this. I wish I would have known this before I did X, right? I, I got married. I had kids. I you know, wish I would have done these things. I wish I would have known all this beforehand. You know what? I, I don't say that now because I, you know, obviously I went through what I went through. But we didn't have that. I couldn't even I couldn't have even said that back then <laughs> because there was no red pill. There was no manosphere. There was no seduction community. It was the it was the dark ages of intersexual dynamics, man. Certainly, I, I've said this before is the 90s were really the apex of like feminism and gynocentrism. And we just simply didn't know it. Every time I used the example of like watching like uh, was it Friends, you know, the, the sitcom Friends or how pop music of that era and maybe a little bit before that, like 80s and 90s, is like ruined for most people because you have that education right now. Now, imagine this. You're Rolla Tomasi and you are 25, 26 years old and you're in the middle of all this. You got no clue. I made it up as I went along. Are you kidding? She wasn't a, a, a unicorn, but we built. You don't find a unicorn. You can make a unicorn, I guess. I don't know, maybe whatever that qualifies as. But you don't find a turnkey relationship. You build it. You build into it. And I'm glad I figured that out as early as I did. So am I saying it's going to work for you? Oh, go, go out there and get married. No, I'm not going to tell you to do that. And the people who are telling you to do that, the reason why they are, the reason why Hafiz is so oh, clutching his fucking pearls because guys are having babies out of wedlock and guys on Fresh and Fit are like, you know what? I got a main and I got four side chicks or, you know, I'm going to be poly whatever us <laughs> you know the reason why i get it, it it grates on him and he's got he's in like sort of this like moral crisis right now is because it goes against all that old order programming that should work it should work because if it doesn't work then that that rattles the the ideological cage that rattles the spiritual cage and that's exactly the cage that i rattled with ariella same thing different topic same thing um, what else is going on? What are you guys doing in the chat right now? Stop screwing around. Screwing around. Uh, simp for Rolo. Thank you. I used to simp for girls. After reading your book, I swore I will only simp for you. You're goddamn right. There you go. You, thank you. <laughs> okay, whatever, dude. Don't simp for me. Don't simp for anybody. Simp for yourself. Simp yourself. Maybe that should be, we, we should start a hashtag for simp yourself. Uh, did I miss? Who else did I miss? I missed a yellow one. There it is. Uh, Rolo, one on one with Dr. Jordan Peterson, Kevin Samuels, Hafiz, Mike Rashid. The world is waiting. Well, you have my fucking number, man. I'm not hard to find, guys. 
I'm not hunting for an interview right now, especially not this month. I'm not hunting for an interview. You know why I went and 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 went on Elijah's show and 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 that was like I said, it was a great experience. I would do it again in a heartbeat. But you know why I went on that show? Not because I called him and said, Hey, dude, I really want to be on your new show. I didn't do that. He found me, man. He called me. That was great. Thank you. I mean, you know what that means? That's genuine desire. That means I want you to come over here. Let's do this. Cool. Myron calls up, hey, I want you to come and do a show on, you know, grape culture. I'm there. You want me to come do a show? Okay. Tell me when. Tell me where. I'm not, I'm not hunting for, I'm not, I'm done with Tim Pool, by the way. Like if Tim Pool wants me to be on the show, I, I, I'll wait till Lydia or whoever's the producer is now. Well, she can call me up. She knows where I'm at. They know where to find me. Joe Rogan knows where to find me. All these guys know where to find me. Every my haters know where to find me for crying out loud. So I've been a permanent fixture in this for 20 years now. I got no effing excuse. Okay, let's keep going. This is actually really good. I want to finish with this because I've got some stats here to throw on. And so to me, it's like when people are projecting these luxury beliefs where individuals can just be by themselves and have kids with people and do whatever they want and it doesn't affect them maybe when you have nannies and maybe when you have all this money and maybe you know maybe in theory quote unquote that can work for some but for the masses that adopt these ideas that's leading to the continuous breakdown of society that's been affecting us and still affecting us today yeah yeah that's a great point you know there was a yeah yeah that's not a great point i'm going to show you why that's not a great point because hafiz I don't know if you know this, but this has been happening for a long time now, my friend. So let's go and look at some stats today. Here's here's the stat heavy version of the rational mail today. Um, here we go. Not all women are like that or not all X are like that. This is what Nawalt means. OK, so here we go. The mistaken belief that because you can name someone over here in the 13 percent that you <laughs> that this center line does not exist. OK, so what happens is when we start talking in terms of Nawalt or not all women are like that or not all X are like that. And you're going to hear Hafiz talk about this here because he yeah, it's funny to me how when I make generalizations. People go, oh, those are sweeping generalizations. It's not always like that. And they focus on, they focus on the idea that, you know, uh, what, what is it? Uh, the, the joke, I guess it's a joke, um, is that, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, anecdotes. And <laughs> I'm trying to struggle for a word. Anecdotes are not the plural of data. And so whenever I talk about something, I actually wrote like at least two essays about generalization because people had to have this freaking explained to them. Right. Generalization is what what we use. It's part of the scientific process. You have to have a control group, man. You have to look at the larger pool. You don't even know what those the outliers are unless there is a generalization in the first place. And I hate it when we get down to this topic because I and I will talk about this here. I'll just briefly here. It's called the lie of individuation. And it kind of goes back to like not all women are like that. It's looking at the furthest end of the bell curves to say that that's that represents the whole. But it does not represent the whole. And when we get into things that don't taste good or emotional appeals or old order way of thinking, we want to think that everyone is a special individual. We want to think that everybody is the is the same, but we're all unique. And so it's the, are, are we all like little snowflakes or are we all like all is one? And I think that like sort of like the, the liberal mindset or the a more, let's just say, free thinking mindset tends to like deftly navigate that cognitive dissonance. Like it, those are two competing ideas. Okay. Either we're individual snowflakes, unique and, and made, you know, uh, individuals, or we are just this way, you know, or we're just, we're all the same and we're all in this together and we all have to, you know, pitch in. It's like this communitarian slash socialist kind of ideal. Plus the fact that we're all unique individuals. Well, what is it, man? Because one is going to negate the other. One is going to, one is more generalized and one is more specific, let's just say. Now, are people individuals? Yes, of course they are. Are they unique? Nobody's, nobody's like Roland Tomasi. Thank God. Right. But I'm a human male on planet Earth. I breathe oxygen. Um, my, I, my body is accustomed to what, 0.9 gravity. I don't know what the, what the, what the number is, but gravity on planet Earth. Um, 
I have a dog. I have certain talents. My personality is what it is. Uh, and there's a genetic component to a lot of that. Let not No lie. But there's also environmental and learning components to it as well. But find it, you know, <laughs> the perfect storm that is Rolla Tomasi or you for that example, for, for you know, sake of example, probably doesn't exist too, too often, coexist too often. Even, even biological, you know, perfect identical twins still have, you know, something that's a little bit different than the other one, right? They don't finish each other's sentences no matter what Hollywood movie you're looking at. Um, and thank you, Steve Stewart Williams, for enlightening me about twins. That was actually a really good chapter in his book. Uh, the ape that understood the universe. Go get if you want a sort of a primer, a good primer. Get that book. Uh, it's a primer for uh, evolutionary psychology. But so the idea that if, that generalization shouldn't exist because everybody's special and no, nobody knows nothing. I dealt with that with Ariella or Ariella. I think that's her name. Because it's all, you know, hey, we're all, you know, it's, it's spirituality and, and, and we're all vibing and we're all different and we're all spinning on planet Earth, man, and it's all groovy. And I'm like, the, the, the problem that a lot of guys have, especially old order thinkers, is that that in some way negates the data sets. It negates the commonalities. It de negates the... the it negates the idea that maybe we're a little bit more alike in, in some ways or that we're a little bit more predictable biologically, evolutionarily speaking, than not. And the reason why people get upset with that, particularly people like sort of the woo-woo magical, let's go do ayahuasca in the Amazon rainforest, get pissed off at that is because it makes them predictable. Or it seems like it does. It it removes a certain degree of control. Um, trad cons have a problem with it as well because it sort of removes uh, personal responsibility. Because if I say, hey, look, your your personality is at least, you know, I, I, I don't know the percentage, but it is in some ways determined by your bio biology. Oh, it's all about personal choice. Well, now and then when we start talking about like uh, the, uh, when we start even just having the question about free will, that is rubs them the wrong way. And it also rubs the opposite side, like the, the spirituality of the left and of the right. And I'm using those in abstract terms is difficult for for both of them because again it's old order ways of thinking it's old order belief sets and i'm not saying they're all they're all worthless or not but i'm just saying it's it conflicts with some of that some of that and that's what they're having a problem with and when it comes to intersexual dynamics now we have to mix in sex and reproduction and you know the angst and anxiety that comes along with that so i throw I thought i'd throw this one out there women tend to dot and this is Sorry, black pill doomers. I, I lifted this from you guys. Women dominate that area of the not all women. Like they, they they kind of bastardized this, is what it was. And men tend to dominate up in those those upper areas. Now, when we talk about high value men, if you look at like the from from the point where it says uh, male upper hand, that's I would argue that's probably about the twenty percentile, maybe ish, right there. And that right, and this is more meta scale, okay. I'm not just saying it's well, it's just like women this or just like women that, but I think what's funny is this right here or even this right here. We don't want to talk about that. We want to say that the the sweeping generalizations are in that 34.1 percent and the other 34.1 percent, and that's where that's where the work gets done, man. It's not on the outliers. That's where the work gets done. Now I can also use this against against black pill as much as I could use for. So, but those are the data sets. That, those are things that they don't want to talk about. Now, we're going to keep going here a little bit because Hafiz had a really interesting um, take on all of this, and I, I think this is going to. Um, I wonder if I can, let me keep going. I think can I put this in? There it's an interesting article. I think it was earlier this year, uh, David Brooks, he's a New York Times columnist, but I think he wrote this in the Atlantic about it was it was a pretty good line. It was something like, you know, if you want to summarize the last few decades of American society, uh, you could say that life has gotten uh, better for adults, but worse for children. Mm. Uh, you know, it's basically saying that, you know, adults have much more freedom uh, in terms of, you know, what kind of relationship structures they want to have or whether or not they, they want to get married and the option to sort of relocate and move around and so on. There's a lot, I guess there's, there is a lot more sort of um, freedom loosening of norms compared to the decades past. 
But, you know, what he was alluding to with the, the comment about children is that, you know, kids, to, yeah, like you said, kids don't have their, their parents anymore, right? Like a lot of them are raised in single parent homes or with grandparents or, or foster homes or whatever. I mean, it's really, um, it's. Don't you love how we still cling to euphemisms like single parent homes? Rob, uh, clearly like 85, well, certainly at least 42 percent, but more when we look at custody laws and everything else if we're going to go by you know kicking the dad out and the 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 mother has primary custody we're looking at at least 86 percent. so women so let's just call it what it is single mother homes okay let's just go with that we need to stop the bullshit the reason we and i'm, I'm not saying he did this on purpose it's probably because that's what he's all he's just repeating what he's heard over and over again fatherless homes single parent homes okay how many what's the percentage of women who are single parents versus men who are single parents those are some data sets that we really need to look at before we start repeating the same bullshit over and over and over again it's really something yeah to see just like how uh, like how many kids now are, are sort of raised in in, in these uh, uh, kind of non-traditional or atypical kinds of family structures and I mean, of course, like it, it just seems inevitable to me that this is going to give rise to all kinds of, you know, societal disruptions and problems and so on. And I'm not even entirely sure I agree with with this idea that life has gotten better for adults in the last few decades. Because if you actually look at the research on happiness over time, it's kind of inconsistent. But a really interesting finding that I just uh, uh, was looking at was that um, for men since the 1970s, they've gotten slightly happier, uh, which surprised me. Although, mm -hmm. granted, I think this finding was in 2010, you know, so this was like before smartphones had taken off, before oh. <laughs> dating apps, before, yeah. I mean, a lot has happened in the last decade, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But in, in as of 2010, anyway, guys became slightly happier than they were in the 1970s, whereas women were actually significantly less happy than they were mm -hmm. in the 1970s, which actually was Why do you think that surprising. was so? I, I'm not sure. I mean, it could be... Um, I mean, it could be a variety of things. I mean, one possibility is that um, there's a lot of competition, right? Like, it, it could be you know, sort of trying to get a good job, trying to go to college, like all of those things. I mean, I think when you're kind of removed from it, it sounds great. But when you're actually in the midst of it, it can be pretty stressful. Um, maybe dating uh, has gotten harder in some ways. I mean, uh, I have seen this, now um, we're getting somewhere sort of more recent research from I think Pew that in like women in 2020 said that dating had gotten uh, harder in the last 10 years. So, yeah, so, yeah. so since, you know, between 2010 and 2020, women said dating got harder. I wonder if that was also true even in 2010 that dating had gotten harder just because there are the, the rules and the norms around it have shifted. People aren't really sure what to do anymore. I mean, one, one question that I like asking, um, you know, my female friends and just, you know, girls I know, like, you know, what like what do you do in terms of like paying for a date? And, and I always get like such different answers from yeah. from women about like, what are the, you know, like there are girls I know who say like, it's not a date unless the guy pays. But then <laughs> other girls will say like, oh, I hate when a guy tries to pay. Like, you know, I can yeah. pay my own way. Thank you very much. Like that kind of. Okay. We hear this all the time. I'm, I want to back up a little bit here too, because he was saying, you know, women that he has talked to anecdotally, granted, okay, have said that it's become harder to date. Like, what does he say between 2010 and like where we're at right now? Got it. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna we'll, we'll we'll backtrack to that here in just a minute. But he's also talking about like uh, an old order dilemma that we've been talking about really again since the seventies. Who's gonna pay for the date? Are we gonna go Dutch? Let's go Dutch. Why is it that women still even in like women who were not even part of sort of this militant feminist? Uh, movement, let's just say, of the set, you know, late 60s and early 70s, who actually came up with that term in the first place. You know, well, I, you know, women should be able to take care of her, you know, her date if she wants to, blah, blah, blah. I think a lot of women, when it, <laughs> one of the things that these guys never really talk about is like foodie calls, <laughs> which there's a, there's statistics and data for that. Wow. So another, another red pill that is unavoidable. Wow. Foodie. We don't, we've even got a cute little name for it. Foodie calls. When women go and they go on a date with a guy that they have no romantic interest in whatsoever, just because they want to go to Red Lobster. <laughs> what? Oh, but we're not going to talk about that, but we will go back to this 1970s, you know, trope about who's going to pay for who pays for the date. What happened to chivalry? Who's going to open the door? Nobody, nobody talks about this stuff, man. Nobody cares about this stuff. And I'll tell you why they don't care about this stuff. 
because of exactly what he was talking about before. Like, oh, there's this is a this is in some way uh, indicative of how tough it is for women these days to date. Well, good thing we've got all this great. Um, I've got all this great data. Hey, let's look at this. This is from my, I, well, I, this is data I pulled from Statista. This is from uh, my my fourth book. When I, I was talking about marriage and I was talking about sex in my my fourth book, which is The Rational Male Religion, This you'll find this graph in there. Okay? So here we go. 1940 through 2020. This is how couples met. Percentage who met this way. Now, by couples, they mean, again, we're standardizing on marriage. So ultimately, they get together as a result of this. In 1940, you can see who uh, the, the top way of meeting somebody was they met through friends. Okay, great. And you can see that right there. Uh, what's the black line? The black line is through uh, family. That used to be the, the top way to do it. And then we got, uh, let's see, met in primary, secondary school, met in college, and blah, blah, blah. But that the, the one line you need to look at right there is that red line that says online. What's changed? <laughs> What has changed, my friends? What has changed since, since what is it, uh, 2000? Look at that spike. That is an amazing freaking spike, man. That's how they meet. You wonder, why is it? Why? Why is it that, 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 that women are upset? They can't. They, dating is such a hard thing. Because, well, first of all, we're clinging to an old order ideal of what dating is. It's not happy days. It's not 1970 or 1950s, I mean, 1970s, but it's not 1955 anymore. It's not like, what is it? Fantasy under the sea dance, like in back to the future. That's that, that, that shit doesn't happen anymore. This is what happens, Rob Hafiz. That's the data in your face. And you know what? That doesn't taste good. That doesn't taste good when you think that the right way to do it is the old school way. That's why who who pays for the date? That's why we're still talking about that in 2021. That's why, <laughs> okay? Because you're still clinging to this safety blanket of oh well, this is this is the way we should be doing it. <gasps> no, this is the way we do it now. Heterosexual U.S. couples met how how they met their uh, romantic partners 1940 to 2009. I, the other one was a little bit more current, I guess, but you can still see this. You know, with that was just beginning to make that trend. Look at that, man. Oh my God. That's the, this is the more recent one. That's why I use this one in the book. Who was it who was asking me for links for my stats? They all, oh, here you go. I'm, I'll give them to you right now. Those came from Statista or I think Pew. I, I'm not really sure where I picked those up. They're not hard to find. You have Google just as well as I do, man. You can find this shit. It's not hard. <laughs> If a, you know, a huckleberry like me can do it, you can do it too. <laughs> you have, that's what I'm saying, man. The, the, you're unplugged. It's unignorable. And these guys are just like clutching their pearls. Oh, well, I can't believe we're having societal disruption and decay and everything. Oh, well, well, who's going to pay for the date? Who cares? <laughs> no, who cares who pays for the date, man? That's not, that's not a thing. Who even, pay, who even does dates anymore? I talked about the hookup culture and everything else. I mean, we could talk about like Tinder and Hinge and Bumble and all that other great stuff, right? But how do they meet? I I'll, let me tell you, man. I got a real. I'm not gonna. I don't want to go too far with this, but uh, until they give me permission to do so, I might do a full episode with the guys. But I, I was uh, when I was in Miami. I was with uh, Justin, um, Justin Waller and and Sterling Cooper. The first night I was there, they actually come and pick me up from the airport. Thank you very much. Um, I was talking to them and they were showing me like their, their dating profiles and they've got multiple profiles. Yes. One on seeking arrangements, one on Tinder, one on hinge, one on Bumble where the girls have to actually, you know, what hinge and Bumble for sure. The, the women have to approach them. They have to make the first contact. And there was a lot of good looking women. And I've met at least two of them while I was there. And that that's how it happened. That's how they got together on a date for, for whatever it was. I went, by the way, I went uh, for the last the last day I was in Miami, <laughs> actually the day I was supposed to fly out. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, we went out on Wave Runners, man. We went out in uh, Biscayne, or is it, yeah, Miami Bay, Biscayne Bay. Um, went out and for you know went out to the uh, out to that one little sandbar island, and you know people were drinking and living it up and stuff. It was actually a really fun time. But you know they got girls there that they met online. That's how they find them. They didn't go. You know these girls go well. Who's going to pay for the date? <laughs> that discussion never happened that whole time. 
So, you know, what, what, why are we clinging to this? Why are we, why are we clutching our pearls guys? I'll, I'll keep going a little bit more. There's a little bit more to this. Um, oh gosh. And so like, if you're a guy, it's like, yeah. okay, am I with a girl who says it's not a date unless I pay or is it like, you know what I mean? And so like both yeah. sides here are kind of like trying to figure yeah. out, like trying to maneuver and make the right move here to, to, this is like listening to a discussion of guys from like happy days. You guys probably don't even know what happy days is a sitcom, right? It's like 1950s. This is 1950s mentality, even maybe sixties, right? Dating is not what these guys, this, this is not, who cares? Nobody has this conversation. It's not about who pays or who doesn't pay. That that Maybe that comes after like a second or third date. I don't know, or hook up or link up, or we're going to go do skydiving or wave runners or whatever it else, whatever else it is. Or maybe it's just a casual hookup, right? But nobody does dating like this anymore. They do this now. Okay. Yes. The good girl that you meet in Bible study, you probably met her online because you're sure as hell not. In fact, met in church. Look at that right there. Met in church. That line is like a non-existent in 2020. Met through neighbors, met met in college. All of that stuff is in sharp, sharp decline with the exception of, what's the other one? Uh, met, met in a bar or a restaurant. But even that is still a good 15 to 20% below meeting online. So this isn't, oh, well, you're just talking about girls in Miami. No, I'm talking about girls every fucking where. Everywhere across, you know, oh, you're sweeping generalizations. No, this is not sweeping generalizations. This is a data set. It's girls in Oklahoma City. <laughs> it's girls in Butte, Montana. It's girls in Los Angeles or Seattle and Miami and everywhere else, my friends. So don't don't give me this bullshit about well, you know, those girls are just ratchet hoes. It's like my my t-shirt, my ratchet hoes t-shirt. I should wore it today. It's not just the girls on Fresh and Fit. It's like this is it. And you know what? Stardust. Rob, Hafiz, whoever else is still clutching their pearls and saying, oh, the red pill is dangerous. It's going to poison you. This is a red pill that I, you know, I'm aware of it. Are you aware of it? You could be. All you would have to do is go on Google and then you would be aware of it. You can watch my show and be aware of it. Yes. Time to sow some discord please the other person because there are no like formal rules anywhere more the way they, they they're kind of were in the past sort of expectations and so on right um prior to the sexual so revolution i think like that that could be one one element here too is just sort of like the dating but then also the sort of stress around uh, education and career um maybe has gotten gotten more stressful whereas mm. like a lot of guys i mean uh, a lot of guys seem like you know more and more guys are dropping out of the workforce um sort of staying home i mean there's there's been research showing that like a lot of guys who are like actively i think it's been like per capita the number of men who are either not working and not actively seeking work yeah has like grown something like i don't know 20 percent or more uh, well, per capita since, though, since the 1970s and these guys are just kind of like chilling at home, playing games like on their computer or whatever and if you ask these guys are you happy surprisingly a large number of them say yeah like this isn't so yeah. bad you know like letting yeah. your parents pay the rent and like living in their garage mm -hmm. or basement or whatever and just yeah. like you know playing around um these guys seem to be content with that but i don't think women yeah. uh can experience happiness doing that you know what i mean like i think a lot of young guys can just like become like you know blobs <laughs> like find some like <laughs> shallow superficial happiness from that yeah. but i don't think women can just do the same thing i think like they have like a different conception mm -hmm. of what what uh, happiness yeah. might look like and okay so let me pull that out yeah well you guys are a bunch of blobs you guys watching this show you're probably a blob <laughs> no and i i think that this is getting thrown around a little too liberally these days um, you'll uh, me being on top of my tradcon conservative TV talk shows these days. This is a real hot topic with guys like Andrew Clavin or whoever, you know, Ben Shapiro or Glenn Beck. I don't know. Um, you know, all these guys are losers. These are the washouts and they're living at home playing World of Warcraft and or whatever, I don't know, Call of Duty. Um, <laughs> Pacific Theater is a badass. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so, you know, all you guys are doing is just sitting around uh, ordering Uber Eats, uh, jerking off to porn, um, going down to the local dispensary, getting weed, smoking weed, 
and living in your like a what is it a hikokomori living in your mom's basement that's you is that you what's that like i love how we so freely throw that around and we go well you know these guys are just no nobody taught these guys they have this very lazy generation yeah maybe but we don't want to talk about why they're the way they are we don't want to say that and he's absolutely 100 correct about women they can't be happy we know that they can't be happy i'll, I'll get some data to show you why they're not happy too but they're not happy because men they're like screw it i'm out why am i going to bother with 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 you i mean it's, again it's that dropout Okay, and I'm not, not talking about lost boys per se. I'm just talking about guys who are just like the juice ain't worth the squeeze, right? This is the black pill portion of today's show. Okay. Yeah, of course they are. There's a, there is definite when you look and you and, and Rob, you know better, god damn it. You've done the studies. I've read your tweets. I know you've done this before. In fact, I might even have this. You know why? You know why he he knows that women aren't unhappy? Because, well, maybe this is Steve. Studies online, he knows that I've heard him quote this before. It's Steve Stewart Williams, but studies online dating show that most men find most women at least somewhat attractive. In, con in contrast, women find 80% of men as below average in attractiveness. Men liked more than 60% of female profiles, while women liked only four and a half percent of female profiles. Okay. Rob, you know this. Okay. No, no, no excuses. Here's how. Here's how I know you know this. <laughs> Research has found that most men find most women at least somewhat sexually attractive, whereas most women do not find most men sexually attractive. Now, he's quoting this and highlighting this from David Buss's book, which is called Men Behaving Badly. And uh, there's a reason why it's titled that, because uh, David Buss is one of these masculine apologists. So we'll get to that when I do that episode. But this is from his book. Research has also found that most men find most women at least somewhat sexually attractive, whereas most women do not find most men sexually attractive. The Bus Evolutionary Psychology Lab discovered that men lower their attraction standards for casual encounters. Wow. But not women. Maybe that has... Holy shit. Maybe that has something to do with the fact that women are unhappy. <laughs> because they, because you their men aren't just they're they're not they don't look like the hot guy in the foam cannon party they don't look like the guy in the the what is it the the fireman calendar <laughs> no, casual encounters empirically they were willing to have sex with partners who meet their just their minimal thresholds on traits they themselves rank as desirable such as intelligence and kindness. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, in in contrast, women typically maintain high standards with whom they choose, whether for casual or pair bonded sexual encounters. Wow. Yeah, we we know that. We'll, we'll I've got more. You want some more studies? Because I got them right here. But Rob, you know better. You and Dave, you're simpatico, man. You're you love each other. You're good. I'm and I love him too. And I love you too. And I love Steve. Okay, we're all one big happy evolutionary family. Okay, you know better. Don't don't pander to to Jordan Peterson. Stop pandering to Hafiz. OK, you know damn well what's going on. Let's let's stick to nuts and bolts. OK, guys. All right. Now, why is that? Because men and women are different. And that's a really tough old order way of thinking that is kind of kicking and screaming. It will be dragged into the 21st century. Men and women are different. We are not blank slates. Gender is not a social convention. Gender is a biological fact. OK. Uh, quoting Hotep Jesus, there are only two genders. Uh, so, well, how do we know that? Well, of course, we do know that this is accurate right here, met online. So we already know that that part is, is you know, that's how people are getting together these days. Okay. So when we say, well, why aren't women happy or why, why can't they? Well, maybe because this is a fact and the fact that women can't find the guy, they have higher standards. They don't find, they only, they only return what, four and a half? Is that what it was? I mean, hold on, they go back to that stat again. That was really, that was awesome. Where is that? <laughs> women liked only four and a half percent of male profiles. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> and this is how we're doing dating right now. So <laughs> you connect the dots. I just work here. All right, age of first marriage. Let's look at this. Oh my goodness, median age at first marriage. Well, we're going to talk about how marriage is, is in decline. Now, this is only up to 2010. I, this might be the study he was talking about. 
from 1890, which is when they first started tracking these stats, um, it was to 2010. That was this. That was a, a stat. I had. Oh, damn it! I didn't get the right one. I have another. I have a more recent one that's all the way up to 2018 or 2019. I think that I used in uh, uh, Rational Male Religion because I was, like I said, the the marriage part of that of the of the book. Again, I had to mind my p's and q's, and that was part of it. Um, at the, what was it in 2019? I'm going to go from memory here. From 2019, it was 6.1 per thousand. So it was at the lowest marriage rate in the United States since they since 1890, right? Since they started tracking this stuff. Why? Why is that? We're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, let's see. So we got to how we met. Let's see. Uh, okay, that was age of first marriage. Okay, this is really good. So this is eight, yeah, years between age 18 and median age of first marriage. Okay. Women in the United States, 1950 to 2018. Here's here's the data. Here's the data. Let's look at this. 1950. Oh my goodness, look at that. Only two two point three years. Years between 18 and 20 and their first marriage. So right around oh 20. Uh, let's say you're you're 20 years old, ladies, and uh, and three months. That's where you're at. Um. So here we go. It remains pretty constant until. Uh, right about 1971 and then things start trending up hmm hmm what could have happened right in, in the late mid to late 60s that would have caused this to happen i just this is a scooby-doo mystery thanks turd funny monkey scooby-doo mystery now we look at this and we go all the way up to 20 uh, 16 2018 right so nine nine years between so you're almost 10 years we're looking at Oh gosh, I mean, I mean, very close to ten years here. So you're looking at 28 for women, as I said, in 20. Well, this is 2018, but the the median age of first marriage right now is something like 28.8, 28.7. Maybe it's maybe it's probably higher than that right now in the U.S. Okay, so guys, this is not a recent fucking trend. Okay, this is not something that just just took us by surprise. We don't know what's wrong with these guys. No, this has been happening since I was born. 1968, well, 71, okay, 1968. Maybe right after that. The date is there. The date is there. I like to do his work here, man. You tell me. Married women, share of U.S. married uh, women married at each age in each year. Now we've got, uh, let's see, 1940, 1960, 19. Okay, so they do it every 20 years here, okay? So if we go and you look at stuff like this, you see like right around 20, and you go look at 1940, right about there, well, you know, 20 is kind of young, but most, by the time women were 30, they were certainly married. In the 60s, man, the 60s was pretty high. And this is just 2013. I don't have it. I wish I had a, a better data set for you for this one, but this was an American Community Survey. Um, so 2013, you can see the decline. I would I would gather that by let's say 2023, the, that data set would probably be much lower even than that. Uh, if Morgan Stanley is correct in their forecasts here, okay. So we've got that going on. So there we go. Well, what did happen? I'm I'm sorry. I'm being facetious and, and jacking you around a little bit. But why? Why? What actually happened back then? Hormonal birth control. I keep harping on that. People keep going. Oh, he just thinks the pill did everything. Yeah, I do. I think it's one of the most significant inventions in mankind. I think it will have more impact on humanity, like hormonal, like unilaterally female-controlled hormonal birth control has done more, has, has changed humanity more significantly than atomic weapons. Take that to the fucking bank. I guarantee you. And we're still, we're only 60 some odd years past that. Why do we get the summer of love? Why do we get the free love movement right after that? Why do we get Woodstock and the hippies and, 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 you know, the seventies with, uh, you know, studio 54, man, why do we get uh, key parties and swingers and, and, uh, you know, playboy penthouse hustler, dirty movies and all on up. Why, wow, where, when did all that start guys? When did it start? <laughs> right after the advent of hormonal birth control. I'm going to, I will prove that to you here in a minute after I get to Tony pajamas who gave me a hundred bucks. Thank you, brother. Oh, you get one of these. That's cool. Oh, hold up. There we go. The Monko, Monko. My stream deck is a little far away. Uh, when Owen Cook and you were on Fresh and Fit uh, show, I felt he was being flippant when listening to the hypergamy poem. 
Eh, I don't know. I'm, this okay. This this doesn't leave this show. <laughs> Actually, I think he might have been a little lit. I don't know. He might have been smoking before he came on. I not. I don't know. But um, your book has helped me. It was sad to hear someone laughing and cracking jokes about it. Well, it is pretty funny in that light. I get it. <laughs> Everything's funny when you're high, right? Um, thanks for keeping your cool about the situation and showing how it's done. Yeah. Well, it's not that I don't like Owen. I just, you know, I think he has, he's a, Owen is a branding animal, just like Julian Blank is a branding animal. They are all, they're all brand. It's all, it's all brand all the time. And a lot of people are, you'll, well, you, a lot of people in the hustle economy, I think going forward, you want to know what's, what my main concern is, is not, not even so much like uh, guys taking the poisoned red pill. It's that the hustle economy guys will become their brand and you, there will be inseparable from their brand. I've talked about this with, uh, with Donovan Sharp before. I want to talk to the man, not the brand. And as people associate themselves with their brand, they become their online persona. It literally, that takes, it's like almost like creating a new personality for yourself. And that personality takes over because it's your source of revenue. It's also your, you know, ego of affirmation as well. And it becomes who you are rather than like, you know, I'm Rolo Tomasi right now. As soon as I turn all this crap off, I'm going to go over there and paint Warhammer miniatures. <laughs> or maybe I go play guitar, right? I'm going to go do something because that's what I do. I'm not, I'm not branding. I'm not doing anything. I'm not making any money. I'm just doing it because I enjoy to do it. When I go off to to uh, do a show or an interview, yeah, I'm Rolo Tomasi then, and that's what we talk about. But there needs to be that separation, and I think that that barrier, that separation, is becoming more and more difficult for guys to to really uh, deal with. That's how you get douche nozzles like the lead attorney or Abba and Preach. Those, that's what they are. They are all brand. Kevin Samuels, sorry, but Kevin is all brand. If you ever saw any of his earlier work, you you would know. If you followed him from like 2015 all the way up to where he is right now, you can see the, where the branding came in. Same thing with uh, uh, who who else? Um, good good examples of this. I mean, there's long story short. Anyways, is like the hustle economy. Like when when your brand of me becomes sort of inseparable from that persona, then you ego invest in that brand. So when somebody attacks the brand, they're not attacking the brand; they're attacking you. And that's, I think, is going to be more and more difficult to, for guys to separate in the, the coming, the coming apocalypse. Anybody else? I thought I was doing pretty good here. All right, all right, all right. Got that. Thank you, Tony Pajamas, for that hundred dollars. It's much appreciated, my friend. Oh, there's one. Funky. Track cons think that if men take more responsibility, women will happily get with them. Ha ha ha. Yeah. You know why? Old order thinking. Men just man up and take responsibility. Well, you can't tell generations of men to man up after telling them for generations to man down, to get in touch with their feminine side, to do this. To, where were you in 2010, Tradcon? Where were you in 1995, Tradcon? Where were you in 1985, for that matter? Nowhere to be found. Well, you know, personal responsibility, bootstraps, right? Okay, that only goes so far in an era of information where we have statistics like this. So. Responsibility without authority is slavery. You will never, if you, you, you saw, maybe you saw this. When I went on my first show with, um, with Sydney and with Elijah, that was the first thing out of my mouth. I said, you want to know what the, the problem with men today is not responsibility. It's about authority. Men don't even, men of this, these last two generations, millennials and Z, do not even pretend or do not even presuppose to assume authority. It's all even Steven. We're all blank slates. Let's be egalitarian. Let's pay for dates, right? Who's going to pay for the date? That only exists when men don't have authority. That only exists when we presume a blank slate between men and women. That only exists when we have a social construction, you know, foundation for what makes a man and what makes a woman. That's why we're still talking about this since 1973. That's why. First thing out of my mouth. There you go. Yeah. Oh, man, I need somebody give me a, 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 a sound drop for that. If you really want to support this show, don't give me a, don't give me a super chat. Give me a sound drop that I can use. Um, let's see. And you want to talk about super chats, man. 
uh, let's see what you again. I thank God for online dating because it made me made so much easier uh, to ask a lady in person. Right. You know why? Because if you've read my first book, The Rational Male, that's a buffer. It's a buffer against rejection. Don't don't become over reliant upon that, my friend, Mr. Dung. Mr. Dung, Senor Dung, Senor Dung is fun. You're all over the place today. It took me all to figure out why there are so many guys asking them on line dating versus doing the hard work by doing good person. Okay, good for you. <laughs> um, you you win super chat of the show today, Mr. Dung. Congratulations, Wait, You should get something for that. Here we go. How about a hey y'all? There you go. That's you gotta hey y'all for, for that. See, you're all over the place. Yes. Well, I'm actually, this is a pretty good point. Uh, women have been desensitized by online dating. Mm, yeah, but they're also still women. That's the problem. That's why we still are wondering who's going to pay for the date. Because women want you to pay for the fucking date. That's why they want a man to, who's in control, who, whose frame into which they would like to willingly, organically desire to be a part of. That's why. And none of these guys, because we've taught generation after generation of guys that we're all equal. We all should be even Steven and egalitarian. And they don't even presume to take any kind of masculine authority. You know when to know why the red pill is so outrageous today? Or a guy like Andrew Tate or Sterling Cooper or, or Justin Waller or myself or anybody else, you know, that you would look up to in the in sort of a red pill community. You want to know why it's so outrageous? It's because we presume to take authority. That's why. It's not even so much about like, oh, you got to be a dominant man in the hierarchy. You know? Yeah, that's important. But you know why you, you're there in the first place? Because you you have the ball. You're conceited enough to say, you know what? I'm taking authority. When I talk about issues of frame, and I've done, God knows I've done lots of work on frame, both in literary and on video. When I talk about frame, it's building a life into, building a world into which a woman wants to be a part of. And therefore, you have to be a good judge of character and tell you to decide who's, who, what woman you want to be in that world, right? Whose frame you have. But you don't get frame until you have the balls enough to say, God damn it, I'm in, I'm in power here and I'm in, I'm in authority. And as these guys are talking, they're crying about traditional marriage and crying about, you know, single parent homes and crying about all this stuff. It only results because men don't take authority. That's why. Because we've told guys, man down. You, how, how dare you? Oh, God, I don't have that ready. How dare you take, how dare you take authority, right? There we go. How dare you? How dare you take authority? Don't you know who I am? <laughs> I'm a woman. I'm waiting for my king, but. And not, not the guy that's going to actually take the authority. I still want to be the queen. What about college guys that smoke weed, beat off, own their own house, and make $250,000 a year? Uh, I'd be, is that you? Cool. Because you are a rare animal, my friend. Men are done with women, not the other way around. Uh, boy, I <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> by hook or by crook. Whether they're making that kind of money or not, they are. <laughs> I'll tell you what's funny. You want to know, you want to know why, um, why guys have dropped out like and this is not like some you know like hey guys let's all get together and we're all going to drop out of the central marketplace hey screw those women we don't want them in our lives anymore we make lots of money on our own don't, nobody nobody's organizing that mra's never got that never got that busy right but i think there's this you know prevalent idea that guys all you know migtow in particular got together and said okay we're not it's the he-man woman's hater club from the little rascals we're just going to do what we're going to do. Most guys in uh, are not like you, Mick, Mick Chilla. Mick Chilla. That was a good one. I like your name. Okay. What do you get? Uh, Mick Chilla gets. Where are the cheetos? There you go. You get one of those. Most guys, like, as we can see, most men are, are dropping out. They don't, most men are not you. They don't make that kind of money. And maybe they smoke weed and beat off and still can stay on top of their game. What, what do you got a drop shipping company? <laughs> I don't know, but you're a rare animal, my friend. So there you go. But even either way, whether you're a loser or you're making a quarter million dollars a year, you're still out and you're still affecting the whether, whether you've decided that it's not worth it or whether you're just like, you had decided that you're not worth it and you're a loser. The effect is still the same, ultimately. Timmyus, thank you for that 10 bucks, my friend. And what else? Anybody else here? Because I'm going to go back to work here in just a second because we got one more thing to look at. 
I got lots of stats for you today, guys. Lots. Um, what else? Oh, Josh. Hi, Josh. What do you got? What do you got for me, Josh? Uh, off topic. What armies do you have for Warhammer? Uh, it would be easier for me to tell you what armies I don't have for Warhammer or haven't played in the past. Anyways, I don't have Necrons. I don't play Necrons. I just, I remember when they came out and they were like this kind of like experimental thing in like white dwarf back way back in like that. I think it was early nineties. And I never, that could never really appealed to me. I mean, they're cool, but I don't play them. Um, so I think what else I don't pretty much everything else though. My, my main, my main, actually I like horse heresy stuff better right now. Cause it's more true to the old school game. I've been playing more horse heresy than anything else. Um, let's see. Steve, now I caught you. Okay, the guys who don't understand your position on marriage are guys that don't watch, read your material. Of course not. But you know what they do? They have they 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 can't ignore the guys who who you know parrot back whatever they've read of my material. Uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Yes, thank you very much. But and that's uh, that's a problem. Is I it's like uh you, you guys are familiar with the telephone game like when you were a kid and you were like say one thing in some some kid's ear and you whisper it and they have to pass it around the the group until it comes back to the original and it gets completely distorted as a result of that that's what i think a lot of the time happens with my work and and sometimes deliberately by white pill fuckwits you know this oh yeah roll tomasi said women can't love men really pass it on okay bye -bye. And so then by the time it gets to somebody, a big public figure, or somebody with a big channel, Rollo Tomasi, that guy's married. Don't listen to what he says. <laughs> Rollo Tomasi says women suck. <laughs> All from like, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. It's a it's the whisper game, man. Stop playing the whisper game with my name. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see. Yeah, they're not familiar. And a lot of these guys, and I can't expect them to be familiar because they're, it's not, it's off, in some cases, it's just off brand for them. I'm actually, thank you, Elijah Schaefer, for having me on because at least you understand, like when I got there, Sydney had done her, her homework. I mean, she was asked, she asked me about Warhammer armies for crying out loud. Um, and she knew that I had greyhounds. I'm like, Grail, man, thank you. Thank you for actually like going to you know figure out who the hell this guy is. Uh, white lion, white lion. Wait, wait. I now I know I now two solid marriages. Yours and my grandparents, and uh, you know, I know two solid marriages. My grandparent, yours, my grandparents, and my grandma said that all guys she knew, my grandpa was the one with the standout the most, of course. Like the, the machine doesn't change. And I, these guys were talking about exactly this a minute ago. They can't understand why women are depressed and they can't, why all of Rob Henderson's girlfriends or friends who are girls, um, <laughs> can't find a guy or they're frustrated with the sexual marketplace. Of course they are because the machine doesn't change. Hypergamy doesn't change. It is what it is. Hypergamy was it? T-Rex doesn't want to be fed. T-Rex wants to hunt. Same thing with hypergamy. Hypergamy doesn't want to be told that it has to choose what you want it to choose. It's going to, it wants to hunt. <laughs> Definitely wants to hunt. It's a biological imperative. We want to pretend like it's, you know, we're again, social conventions. So, well, women should unlearn their standards and go with guys who are losers because guys are different now and women are going to college and record numbers and making money. Here, you know, there you go. You get your, I think I gave you that. All right, let's keep going. Uh, now, that was Rob Henderson. There's more to that. I, I really don't want to dig too much into that. Uh, furthermore, because the reason why I brought that up where we at? Okay, we're almost at the at the two hour mark here. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be good. Um, I'm going to show you the the main video that I wanted to get to today because that video, god damn it, that video that I just showed you, Devil Mountain Coffee. Uh, that video I just showed you inspired the one that I'm about to show you right now. And this is really what I wanted to get to because this is a textbook glaring example of old order imperatives or old order ways of thinking um, versus the, the inability to deal with new order information. Okay. So again, let me reiterate 
when we talk about marriage, when we talk about relationships, when we talk about intersexual dynamics between men and women, and we go, man, they're really screwed up right now. Our first assumption is that it's men's fault. Remember, women are wonderful. <laughs> but our, our first presumption is that, well, men aren't taking responsibility, and therefore that's why women are, you know, unhappy with men or unhappy with the, the sexual marketplace. Women would be better women if men would just be better men, okay? We always start and always blame men for the state of women. Now, about two or three weeks ago, I did a, a show and it was titled um, Men Aren't Responsible for Women's Unhappiness or something like that, the state of women. And I kind of got a little bit deeper into that, but I wanted to um, I'm gonna throw this out here too because I think this is a really important, this is some imp very important data here. Um, where did that one? Okay. I've used this before, but this is a really great, uh, stat here. Okay. Now this is the demographics of long-term antidepressant use SSRIs for lack of a better term. Um, older white women account for 58% of adults who have used antidepressants for at least five years now for at least five years. Now the data goes all the way up and I think it ends at 2020. So if you look at the, the prescriptions from 2000 versus where it spiked, and where was the spike at? 2010. So when we talk about at the same time that Rob was just talking a moment ago, is that, you know, 2010 is right around when women started being very dissatisfied with women or with, with men, right? Or with their dating prospects, let's say. Okay, what happened? Well, well good night. What happened? Women are taking, I don't know, Prozac or whatever, whatever they're being prescribed right now. In record numbers, as we can see, that is a dramatic spike in prescriptions for women and primarily white women 45 or older. Okay, White men, 45 plus, younger adults, blah, 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 monthly uh, minority women, 45. It's interesting that you're a minority that you're like, yeah, you can use them if you want. <laughs> But it's it's fa it's it's amazing that 45, 45 or older. Now remember, um, this is having used it for at least five years. So you're looking at women who've used it from the time they were 40 until they get to be about 45 or older. So keep that in mind. All right. Well, we got that. Here's another good data track right here. Worldwide, females earn 18 trillion. And this is in September of 2017. Females earn 18 trillion dollars, but spend 28 trillion dollars. How could that be? <laughs> Maybe because they're in positions where they can allot and allocate money and allocate funds, whether it's theirs or it's the government's or it's their families or whatever else. They're the ones who are doing the spending. But we, as we can see, they uh, they outspend by $10 trillion compared to what they earn. Thank you, Uberfax. Again, I just work here. Put on my work here. Let's go to work. <sighs> All right, let's, let's, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Let me, okay. Here's a few more stats just so we can get, well, you know what? Let's do this. I, I'll start with this. Cause this, I want to get to this. Really. But before we jump into the topic, I'm going to ask you guys a question and I want you to. All right. Let me, let me pause this for one second. This is a, from a video titled like hypergamy and like what's wrong with women today. This was just last night, I think is when he posted this. And this comes like after his interview with rob so this is i think this is sort of his like way of sort of his catharsis right his way of like like sorting this out for himself hold on to the question i'm gonna re-ask you the question at the end of the video okay and here's the question i want to ask you guys most people know that most americans most individuals live paycheck to paycheck we all know that most people are not making $100,000 a year. Most people are making anywhere between forty-five dollars to about $55,000 a year, and they're living paycheck to paycheck. So you understand how most people live. But some people make $100,000 a year and even more, and they live very financially free lives. So with that being said, how do you want to live your life? Do you want to... Okay. Notice that we don't talk about like what the percentage of guys, like how many, how many got, and of course he's using men as the example here, like some people, well, yeah, some women do too, but we're not going to talk about them. That's not really what his, his focus is on. But when we're talking about like 
who's making what kind of money? Oh, he's, he's correct, man. I, what's the ad? I think the median income in the United States is something like $50,000, 56. Oh, that's a combined, man. I don't know, but I'm sure it's not a hundred thousand, right? But some people, some people make a hundred thousand dollars. They don't say about well, how they do it or what they're doing to get that, or they're on their hustle. And still even like a hundred thousand dollars today is not what it used to be. But Point is, we're talking about guys, we're gonna talk about women. Live your life the way most people live, struggling paycheck to paycheck, or do you wanna to strive to be part of the select few people, the small minority who live financially free lives? I'm very curious, we'll talk about it at mm. the end of the video. Okay. Before we jump into it, let's find out what the word hypergamy means. I looked it up online because I wanna get the most official definition possible. So, wait. Let me stop you. It's from the 1950s something uh, sociology uh, research in India about the India's caste system and its women's um, tendency to marry up, right? Hypergamy is a term used in social science for the act or practice of a person marrying a spouse of higher caste or social status than themselves. Yeah, well, that's because it came from a study about the Indian caste system from the 50s. I want to say maybe it's the late 50s. I mean, 60s, I don't know. Yeah, they were studying the caste system in India, and that's where the term was coined. It's not what it means today, but let's continue. So usually when people are talking about hypergamy, they're talking about it in regards to women and the nature of women, a.k.a. female nature. Mm -hmm. And what they're generally telling guys is that here's what you need to understand about women. All right. Halt. He's going to he's going to couch this once again in the terms of the ideal goal state being marriage. He's already set the he's already tilled the fields, right? Well, marriage, marrying up, marrying higher socioeconomic status. Yeah, well, in the caste system, he even mentions that in India, but largely that's what it means. Again, hypergamy is not just about the beta bucks side of hypergamy. There's the alpha seed, aka alpha fuck side, which no one ever wants to talk about, including Jordan Peterson, including these guys, because marriage, again, is the definition of of success that's the goal state it's the goal state. it's it's the measurement by which we measure cuckoldry it's the measurement by which we say there's a father in the house or there's a there's a, it's a two-parent household or father's involvement with their children marriage sets that marriage is the only it's the gold standard it's the only way we we track numbers and so therefore he can't think outside of the old order that says marriage is the only way we can, this is how we judge, this is how we, we judge our, our statistics. This is, this is, it's the metric by which we measure our sexual marketplace and the metric also by which we measure hypergamy. Women, generally speaking, want to marry men greater than themselves. Clearly they don't want to get married. They don't even want to get married. I'll show you why. Actually, you know what? I'll show you why right now. Women don't even want to get married. They, they might want to marry the high value guy. Sure they do. Right. What do we say? Oh, this is the age of first marriage. We got to that. Um, let's see. We got to that. Uh, let, oh, this is great. Here we go. Marriage timeline. Okay. Right after World War II. Great. But look what happened right around. Hmm, hmm, that seems like that's right around the sexual revolution. Uh, late 60s. It's 1970. Imagine that. Unbelievable. All right. Well, that was neither here nor there. This is divorces i'll get back to divorces here in a second but uh there it is okay waiting for marriage got this one okay people are waiting to get married median age at first marriage hmm look at that and this one okay this is just i think this is 2019 this is from the the census man so again i just work here lowest marriage rate and highest age since when 1960. Look at that. Thank you for playing. All right. Okay. Women don't want to get married. Men, <laughs> men, certainly men don't want to get married either, but a uh, percentage of married among those age 35 and older by sex. Well, look at that. Oddly enough, it's, well, this one start at least. Okay. So this is the, the age demographic for this, which of course is the, uh, the 35, but you know, still late seventies. Look at that kick. Look at that kick right there. 
funny how it plummeted right after World War II. <laughs> Baby boom, anyone? Right. So once again, we're using marriage as the metric. And marriage is the gold standard here for Hafiz because he can't think of it in any other term. Women still want to fuck guys, Hafiz. I, I don't know if you know that. But they still want to fuck guys. They want to get married once they're their sexual prospects or once once they're out of that that peak phase once they've expired their their most productive let's just say their most opportunistic years yeah and they want to marry a guy who's going to you know provide long term security for them problem is they're too old now because the machine doesn't change hypergamy doesn't change evolution doesn't change yeah, certainly not evolutionary firmware right whether it's more degrees more money, um, more attractiveness, whatever more is, women generally want to men greater than themselves. And then when you watch a lot of female nature videos, they will talk about the nature of women is to be with the alpha male. She wants to climb to the top of the social hierarchy because of her hypergamous nature. She is never content until she gets what she views is the absolute greatest male possible that she can acquire. Okay, now we can define terms. All right, thank you. Thank you for getting us to this point, Hafiz. Okay, hypergamy is not just a study in Indian caste systems, okay? It's not just about marrying because marriage should not be the metric for hypergamy. We're looking at hypergamy in, in the sense of innate, evolved, natural, you know, evolutionary firmware, man. It's, the, it's women's OS. And that com is combined with or that is a dualistic mating strategy. And that is alpha fucks, beta bucks. It's not just about, oh, she's got to find the guy who is, she's going to, her, her goal is to marry the most highest guy that she can get. Yeah, well, once she gets to the point where she's exhausted all of her other options or she's, you know, had a good hoe phase, right? What is the hoe phase? And we, we laugh about it. I call it the party years in preventive medicine. But what is actually the hoe phase? It's, it's women trying to maximize their most sexually selective years. And, you know, we don't, like, do women consciously go, hmm, well, now I'm 21. I think within the next few years, or 18. Now I'm 18. I'm an adult now. So between now and 28, I really better play the field. They're, no, they're not thinking that. It's fun. That's the, that's the ultimate cause. The proximate cause is I want to get to the club so I can go find hot guys to bang and or get with in some capacity. Yeah, do women like one of the things that I think is the worst question to ask women that that Fresh always asks on every damn episode of Fresh and Fit? What do you look for in a guy? Well, any anytime you ask that, you're only going to get answers that come from the beta buck side of hypergamy. I want a guy who's got money and he loves his mom and he wants puppy dogs and he likes children and you know it's going to be all these really, you know that the the answers that sound right. It's not going to be the dude has to be six foot tall, uh, like has about nine inch cock and he's got to have biceps like Mike Rasheed. Right? But they don't say that because that makes them look like a hoe. But actions, again, uh, what is a medium is the message. When you look at behaviors and see who these women are with, yeah, pretty much. But again, that's you have to be living in the world and you have to sort of you know, be aware of what's going on. I mean, you can't be just sitting, I mean, shit, even in porn, right? It's still the same thing. Usually it's not like some like weedy little dude who's like, you know, got like a two inch cock. I mean, unless that's your thing, right? It's, it's usually a guy who's taking control. And he's like, according to Sterling Cooper anyways, I mean, that's what makes for good porn. Well, if that's all you're seeing, yeah, I mean, it pretty much lines up with the evolutionary imperatives there, but that's the alpha fuck side of it. The beta buck side is all he can think of at this point. That's because that's the goal. I, don't, I think he's still holding himself. I, I don't know. Am I wrong about this? Because I thought I heard him say that he was still a virgin on the Ruslan show. I'd have to go back and and like scrub through that and see if I can find that bit. Um, but I, I do know he's unmarried and I do know his folks are still married. And again, this is not a cut on him, but I'm just saying he is representative or at least a member of that demographic. So uh, let's get okay so that is generally speaking and i'm you know i hate when i do these videos because there's always one guy online who disagrees with me who likes to share their opinion i never watch your videos by the way <laughs> yes you do and so i want to make it clear this is just all my opinion 
So that's generally speaking, an understanding of hypergamy and female nature. And there are three huge things that I need every single man to understand about hypergamy and female nature. Three Only things. Three. Do not forget it. The very first thing we is that this. women Sorry. exist offline. You see, one of the, the most frustrating parts about doing this content is seeing how many guys live their lives based upon the women that they experience on the internet. So many young men today, you're watching channels and videos and content creators, and you're learning about women from what they tell you, from what they show you, from the perspective of these individuals. You see, there are truths about hypergamy and female nature that people espouse online. But I'm telling you, so many people online exaggerate realities to sell views. No one cares about views, by the way. They care about engagement and click-through rate, but they don't care about views. I think that needs to be like settled right there. Okay. Oh, you you sell a product, you sell books, you were trying to get viewed. What about your sub? Trust me, it's not about subs. Subs are a vanity metric. Views are a vanity metric. Likes are a vanity metric. That has nothing to do with the algorithm, by the way. It's all about your thumbnail and the title of the video and how many people clicked on it. Click through rate. That's what boosts your engagement. So let's cut the bullshit right there. Now, uh, second of all, uh, yeah, I, I 100% agree with them on this part right here. Guys need to get out. They need to experience women. And you know what happens when they do? They ex understand that hypergamy is actually a thing. That's the problem, Hafiz. They do. Yeah. They, are there guys that like, you know, sit in their rooms all day and jerk off to porn and, you know, order Uber Eats? And yeah, of course, just like you were talking about with, with Rob, Rob Henderson a little while ago. Yes. That, is that a problem? Absolutely. You will hear the red pill say exactly that too. The red pill will tell you, my guys, at least in my circle anyways, will say, get out and do. Game is the practice. Red pill is the theory. One is incomplete without the other. I don't know how better to explain that. And that's if you're listening to quality top, you know, good content, like people who have, you know, have, are knowledgeable about the subject. Yeah. In the black pill community, I'm sure it is. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to drop out of society because we, we, bitches ain't nothing but tricks and hoes. <laughs> Not mommies in the club. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. You should definitely not just, you know, use your online knowledge of women to express it into all, you know, generalized to every single woman. Got it. That's why I said not all women are like that. But again, we're going to go back to this chart one more time. The problem with this is that the women that are out there that you're in, do you know any actual women? Yes, they're in the 34, what is that, that you know, that 34.1% to the 34.1% on the opposite side. That's where most of them are. And you know where the most of them are as well? They're meeting guys online. Okay. This is not me going out and, you know, giving you anecdotes. People say, oh, Roll is not in the sexual marketplace. You don't know what he's talking about. No, but I do know how to read charts, my friend. And it's very easy to do. All you got to do is have a little bit of base curiosity and you can put two and two together. Again, I just, I, I just work here, man. I just, I put, I connect dots. It's not about me trying, in fact, if anything, I want guys to have a better uh, relationship with them. And I ac absolutely do. I, as I've said before, we're better together than we are apart. We're compliments to one another. Yes, yes, yes. But the stats is, the stats is what the stats is, my friend. And so it's not about like gloom and doom or nihilism or anything like that. It's about the statistics and how people are interpreting it. And you know what? Until you can accept that, and until you can accept that your old order way of thinking about those stats is something you may not, might need to reconsider, then you're going to be stuck and you're going to be like freaking out and you're going to be really, because he's very upset. He'll get very upset later on. I don't know if it's upset, but I mean, he's making this because he's concerned and I get it. I understand. I'd be concerned too if that was still, if I was still stuck in that way of thinking. So many people online understand that if they're going to tell a story that is not biased and not exaggerated, people won't click. So they exaggerate these realities. And so my biggest thing is that I want men to learn about women from actually going into the real world actually logging off to from youtube logging off from TikTok, logging off from instagram and actually meeting 
real life women. You see, that is my story. My story is that like most men, I sh he's is he married? Like, is that his story? Because I don't think he's married. Struggled with women. Like most men, I literally was like Albert Brenneman, no guile and no game. Didn't have my first girlfriend until I was 28 years old. I struggled drastically, but I learned from actually going out and meeting and talking and interacting with different women, different ethnicities, different cultures, different religions, and learning what they were like. And you learn the good, the bad, and the ugly. You learn so many different things that you can never learn online. And so my big thing, my big hope going into 2022 is that you guys go outside. The truth is not in somebody's book. The truth is not just in somebody's 10 minutes. Say my name. A freaking YouTube video. The truth is outside. Right. Go outside and go experience the diversity of life. And I wanted to say something before I move on to the next point. If the truth is only negative, you don't know the truth. It's a good cut. Because for some reason, we there is a. If you're getting drinks thrown in your face, <laughs> that's great. Let me answer this right quick. Uh, given you've said you wouldn't get married again, if you became single, what would you do if you were in your 20s now, single and waiting, wanting kids and family? Uh, is that without marriage or a viable option? You tell me, man. Uh, I would still say that marriage, the way we do it, is an unconscionable contract. Uh, contractual, contractual marriage is, I mean, if you are Hafiz, if you are, if your religious conviction, one of the reasons why I wrote religion was exactly this question right here is if that's your conviction and you're like, okay, uh, you're Hafiz and you don't have a girlfriend until you're 28 years old. Um, then like, <laughs> I, I gotta, I gotta put this, I gotta put this carefully. Um, so what, what do you do? Like, do you, do you get married or do you wait for, do you wait for the right girl? <laughs> like I would say this, here's, here's my, my advice to you is, is if that's your case and I'm not saying you're uh, Bra Bradley, Bradley, I'm not saying you are, you know, this, maybe you're, it's not a religious thing, but you're saying, well, you know, um, I want to have kids still. I'm in my twenties. My best advice to you, of course, is just to stay in your game, um, and date women, understand women, spin plates, my friend, uh, but stay in your grind also. Um, women will not start to take you seriously, I think, until you get to be about 30 and hopefully you've had some accomplishments and your burden of performance is, is what it is. You've maximized your potential. Good. Keep going. Um, odds are in your 20s, you will not. Let's just, what did I just show you? Like average age of first marriage for men is 29.5, 29.7. Odds are you probably will not even consider no woman will consider marrying you until she hits her epiphany phase. That's why I say this stuff. So you're, it's not to, you know, to give you gloom and doom. It's so you're aware of these things. Hey, look, there's a pit right there. Don't step in it. Okay. Well, that's all it really is. You can, oh, no, there's no women for me. That's not why I do what I do. I just simply go and give you the tools and you can decide what it is that you want to do. So you can at least say that you made an informed choice. So that's number one. Number two is I would not get into a marriage uh, as we do it now. Now, Abu American might disagree with me. You know, he's got four. What? Four? Is it four now? <laughs> three? I know he has at least three um, women who are his wives who love him and take care of him. But he's not like having orgies with them. He's just that's He's got one girl here, one girl there, one, whatever. Um, and he doesn't have a contractual marriage with the state. As far as I know, I know he's in Germany. I don't know how, what the particulars are of his arrangement, which is what it is an arrangement. Um, but maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an understanding. Maybe it's a covenant marriage. Maybe it's something like what uh, Ryan Stone has. Ryan Stone's not married, but he's been with the same chick for a very long time. He doesn't have any kids, but it's possible that he could. So, um, I don't know, but we're going to find out Bradley. We're going to find out very soon because marriage is, is going to have to be fundamentally reformed in some way if we're going to keep going. I think men and women are better off being monogamous, certainly, you know, in, in the sense of raising children. Again, I don't hate marriage. I think it's a great, it's been the bedrock of Western civilization for a very long time. 
Okay. It's, it's been a key element of our success as a species, like parental investment has been, but we've corrupted it. And people will say, well, it must be because of the Illuminati and this evil cabal of Satanist Moloch worshiping, Molech, Moloch, whatever, worshiping baby eaters. It's the elves. <gasps> no, what all of that doesn't work unless the machine is what the machine is. Unless women are women and men are men. That's a, you're easily corruptible uh, because you're predictable. Well, sweeping generalizations again. Yeah, but they work in that sense, don't they? So uh, as far as, you know, well, what, what do you want to do? Uh, don't ask me for the ectogenesis or the whatever it is, the birthing pods, because that's science fiction for now. I don't know. Maybe it won't be. <sighs> Take your name. Okay. Naaman Munot. Here you go. I just said your name. Take my name. Say my name. You're goddamn right. There you go. All right. You want one of those? Uh, let's see. Let's see. This is uh, actually, I want to say this is probably Hafiz, like sort of backing up off a of red pill, red pill content. But let's see. Okay. You're always said this is a praxeology. It is a praxeology. That's why I keep telling you. Okay. I took your name. You're welcome. All right, man. Take my name in vain. God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. Name, name, and, name, and, name. And. There you go. Yes. The new world religion is almost here. You're correct. Let's keep going. The culture which communicates that the truth is the most nasty, mean, evil, cold hearted thing in life. No, we're not teaching hopeless nihilism. All right, now we're getting into the part where I was talking about um, uh, Stardust's uh, uh, video from back on Wednesday. Well, it's, we're teaching hopeless nihilism. Well, funny how that worked out, isn't it? Especially coming from Stardust, who has been sort of classically MGTOW slash Black Pill for pretty much his entire, as far as I know, his entire career as an online personality. But again, are we... <laughs> God damn it. Are we preaching judgment calls? Are we preaching good versus bad? It, again, this is why I started off today's show with Ariella. It's emotion and belief versus empiricism and data sets, right? It's, it's, it's emotion and belief versus empiricism and reason. So again, I will ask this question one more time, Hafiz. I ask this of... Stardust, I will ask it of you. Would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? Because now, more than ever, everybody is right. Everybody has access to, at least the, they have, they could, they could acquire the information if they'd like to, to be right. Go outside, get out there and see these girls and see the world and see green land and go fishing. I 100% agree with that. Please do. But in doing so, are you sticking your head in the sand? Because you're not, because you're not, you're unaware of what's been going on. As I said before, when people told me, they said, Rolla, you found a, you found a unicorn in 1995 and that's why you have a good wife. Mm, no, that's not because unicorns don't exist and women are women no matter what year it is. I don't care. It's 1940 or 2020. Women, uh, women is what women is. Okay. But well, I agree. Please go outside. Please put this stuff into practice. Please go out and meet actual women and see what happens when you are you ha change your mind about yourself. That's good. Okay. I'm pretty sure India's divorce rate is not 1% versus 50%. Pretty sure it's not. I'm going to ask um, uh, Deepika about that when I talk to her. I'm going to uh, go watch India's son's name in Munot. Go watch that video. And then you tell me about divorce rates and how great marriage is in India and your culture is better than everybody else's culture. Go watch India's Sons. You want me to, I'll put the, I'll see if I can go put the link in the chat. It's called India's Sons. Go look it up on YouTube right now. Leave the chat. I'm, I'm telling, give me permission to leave the class, my friend. Go watch India's Sons, then come right back here and tell me what you think. Rolo, do you think there uh, should be minimum age requirement, income requirement, and other requirements for getting married and having children? Uh, I don't think that will ever be the case. Do I think that it should be the case? Um, well, I think it should be. Uh, I think we need to fundamentally reform marriage. 
So it's kind of like a kind of an irrelevant question. Like, uh, what will we make the minimum age requirement? What will we make the, the income requirement? That's not it. Because both of those, by the way, serve the feminine imperative. Well, you got to make $50,000 a year or you don't get a marriage license. <laughs> Who, whose interest does that serve? <laughs> Do you think do you think guys of this of this generation, you know, millennials and Gen Z, do you think they give one rat's ass about that? <laughs> no, we need to fundamentally reform marriage. That's why. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Euphemisms. Bradley. Hi, Bradley. Again, thanks for the answer. I agree. I reached the same conclusion. Good. Um. Okay, well, go watch India's Sons, and then you will understand what I'm saying. So there you go. And I'm done with you. Uh, Asanji, uh, do you love Walter? He's a Gamma Gustavo. Is <laughs> He's a Gamma Gustavo is better. Okay, so Walter, you, you mean Walter White from, from yeah, Breaking Bad. Uh, I don't agree that there is a choice between happy or right. Okay, why? Guys, become red pill because blue pill wasn't working and we can be much happier understanding sexual dynamics. Thank you, Vinny, because that is exactly me. Thank you for answering the, today's question. Today's question goes to Vinny. Stop that bitch. There you go. You win, Vinny. Tell him what he won, Johnny. Yes, that's really the summation of all of this. That's what, exactly what I said in the, the video with uh, Stardust when I was doing the breakdown of that. It doesn't have to be. It just it's it, the, the reason why it seems nihilistic, Hafiz, is because you lack the creativity, you lack the understanding, you lack the, um, let's just say, uh, industriousness to see that this is an opportunity to have that this uh, living in a red pill paradigm. If you are creative, if you're a smart motherfucker, if you know how to leverage that, if you can use that to your advantage, wow, Rollo's been married for 25 years. What's his, what's his secret? Well, at least part of it, a good portion of it is being red pill aware. Congratulations. You win the prize today too. Wow. I would hate to be Rollo. He has to game his wife all the time. No, no, I don't because I am the game. It's second nature to me right now. How does Rollo pass the shit test that Mrs. Tomasi gives him? I don't think about it because I just pass it. I never try anything. I just do it because I can now. I have that understanding. It's it's intrinsic now. It's internalized. And the only way you get that internalization, of course, is through practice and understanding and everything else. It's not going, oh, man, just, I hope things are going to work out for the best. You want to know why you go back to the blue pill? Why, why does Rollo talk about the purple pill? Because... Guys get red pilled and go, well, I don't know what to do in the red pill paradigm. There's a few good things I'm going to take from the red pill. I'm going to go back to the blue pill and see if I can make things work out with that new knowledge. And it never does because the blue pill is fundamentally founded on lies, fundamentally founded on conditioning you to believe certain things about intersexual dynamics, about I, there's lots of things, but in my wheelhouse, intersexual dynamics. And you go back and you go, and in fact, that's why I wrote in the very first book, you know, um, was it children, uh, dream girls and children with dynamite? It's like they go to the red pill and they get the dynamite and they go back to their dream girl and it explodes in their face. That's purple pill in a nutshell, basically. Uh, if uh, they have locations overseas where you can get an egg donor and surrogate, well, by all means, <laughs> I'll just shut up now. Go right there. There's your solution, uh, dude. I forget what your name was. 25,000 saves you thousands if you need to have kids. I wish I went that way. I wonder what the legalities of that is. You go overseas. Okay. Well, I, I'm sure you can find a surrogate. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. So it costs, here's the funny thing. It costs you $25,000. I, I would presume you still have to go over there and the trip costs you something as well. So let's just say 30,000 bucks to go over there and rub one out. <laughs> fertilize an egg. What do, what do they put it in? A lamb? Do they clone it? Do they put it in like a lamb uterus or something? What do they do? Is it like a CRISPR thing? I don't know. Um, but isn't it funny that it costs you $30,000 for a guy to become a, electively become a, a, a father, but yet, <laughs> but yet for women uh, in, at least in the Netherlands anyways, they can go and get a sperm donor that lots of them have for 300 bucks and they can go be what they can go be a mom whenever they want to yeah good idea what do you say yeah well that's good well i hey, let me tell you something um 
was this anani uh i i talk about that in religion by the way um with as respect to a covenant marriage versus a contractual marriage and the reason why i even call it that is because dr everett piper and myself had a very long discussion and debate on uh, pat campbell's show uh, i think it was 2018 or something and we talked i took the uh, anti-marriage side and he took the pro-marriage side and of course i made the the case that marriage today is an unconscionable contract and i'm just borrowing from you know migtow and and black i'm not i'm not black pill i'm not migtow i'm uh, clearly i'm not MGTOW. um but i'm not saying that they don't get the diagnosis right i just think they get the prescription wrong but the diagnosis certainly is there's a, definitely something wrong with marriage and we got to figure something out and we're trying actually we're going to do it we might not do it the way Hafiz likes but we're going to figure out how to you know form families or or we're gonna we got to find a, a a better solution than what's going on right now i would hope for but we're already toying with like non-traditional or was it uh alternative relationship styles right poly polyamory which is a, a recipe for fucking disaster as far as i'm concerned because we have a jealousy response because the machine doesn't work that way that's why uh, or it it works that way uh, pretty well for men, but again, that's if you can hit it and quit it and go. Right. So, anyways, uh, yeah, I talked about that—a covenant marriage versus a contractual marriage—and that's really the the. I mean, from a, if you're going to split hairs, that's really what that's the hair to split. Uh, Simon Pan Panides, uh, is there ever a point when facts will suppress feelings? I'm still waiting to find that out, Simeon. <laughs> you tell me. You tell me. Is there? Because <laughs> I haven't. I, I'm not there yet. I haven't found that point. Do women really enjoy playing along with the sexual revolution subconsciously? Of course they do. Um, because it feels good. Because female empowerment. Well, if if somebody says, "Hey, we love you," if if they your constant flattery and constant in, in, you know empowerment and constant you know. Um, you know, uh, build building up your ego. Uh, if you have a constant access to uh, attention, as I said before, if you've got social media, if you've got guys simping for you all the time, you know, I, I'm, I'm surprised women aren't happier than they than they are, honestly. Um, let's see, anything else? Oh, there you are. Okay, yeah, I'm actually um, very interested in India. And we're not teaching immature naivete. It's not what the red pill extremists say. It's not what the freaking Disney Channel feminists say. It's not those two extremes. It's somewhere in the middle. So if you are a man and you're learning about women and your truth is simply cynical, bitter, negative, nihilistic, I'm telling you, your truth is wrong. While on the flip side, if your truth about human beings and human nature is everyone's great and everyone's angel and everyone's a princess, you are wrong too. The truth is somewhere in the middle where most people are not good and most people are not bad, whereas most people are a product of their environment and there's always good people that exist in today's world. And the second thing about female nature that men need to understand is there is no absolutes. You see, so many channels want to tell you that their message is gospel. Their message is the truth. Believe my truth, believe what I have to say. Say my name. I've always said, I am simply sharing my experiences and my opinions. The job of you guys is to listen to what I say, do your own research, pray to God, and go out into the world and see is what Hafiz is teaching congruent to everyday life. But so many men are teaching their information like they're freaking sent from the angel Gabriel. They're teaching their- That's not the angel I would presume I'm sent from, but okay. <laughs> information like it's the most divine truth that if you are a guy and you don't believe what they say you know all the little trigger words that they give to to, to to demonize your viewpoint and your ideology there is no absolute all right did you catch that your viewpoint and your ideology yeah yeah you're right that's the reason why it's offensive to your ideology is because it is a breakdown between empiricism versus belief and Hafiz, I will tell you this. If you contact me today, I will send you a free copy. I will have, in fact, I've got, uh, I still have lots of free copies left from Amazon. I will be happy to ship out a free copy of my book, Religion, to you. And you will see, there's a full chapter on there where I talk about belief versus empiricism. 
uh, what is it? Um, factual absolutists and ideological absolutists. And that's really the pro like whole reason that this is so discerning to, or discon disconcerting to you is because it's it, that's what this is. It's empirical data that doesn't gel. It doesn't jive with your ideology. It's not, it's not, I, again, I, I don't know how many different ways to say this. The red pill is a praxeology. The red pill is data. You know what the red pill is? It's this stuff. Here's the red pill. This is the red pill right here. That's the red pill. And 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 this is the red pill. And this is the red pill. Oh, wow. Gifts work. And this is really what hypergamy is. But we don't want to look at those stats. We don't want to look at that as we know the graphs are great, right? We don't want to look at this. That's the red pill. Now look, messages sent versus messages received online. Holy mackerel. Men, remember, <laughs> uh, remember this? Wait, let's go back to that other one. Here we go. Remember this. Online dating is the number one way that men and women are getting together, or hooking up, I guess, in poor church is sort of in the shitter right now. But and then we look at stats like this. So if they're all online and they're all doing online dating, look at that. My goodness. Messages sent versus messages received. Look at women's line and look at men's line right there. That's the red pill, my friend. That's, what that, that's the praxology. So it's not an ideological thing. It's not like we're saying this. We're, that's no ideological. You can I don't care what the hell you do with this information. I don't make judgment calls here. I don't tell you this. Oh, this is right and this is wrong. And that's really the difference. Like when I, again, I'm going to go right back to the beginning. Here we go. Here we come full circle with Ariella. One of the reasons why Ariella and I disagree, and I mentioned this later on in that, in that, sh and even in that show, is that we're talking about a conflict between belief and empiricism, conflict between data sets, a conflict between and interpreting those, and then the belief in what's right and what's wrong. Nihilism is a very bad thing. Yes, hopelessness sucks, man. I'm, and I'm the last person to tell you to be hopeless. In fact, if you go and you watch the Stardust video once again, at the very end of it, I mentioned, at the, my, I summed it up with one post that I wrote way back in the day. And it's in, uh, it's the last chapter of Preventive Medicine, my second book, Preventive Medicine. And it's called, oddly enough, A New Hope. That's what it's called. It's so you'll avoid this nihilism. It's exactly the opposite of what you're talking about right here. Now, maybe he's not talking about me. I don't know. Maybe I'm conceited. <laughs> but, you know, I think I think it seems it probably seems very nihilistic to him, too. I don't think he's married. And it's I can I can imagine, man, being in his position with his convictions, religious convictions or otherwise. I, I imagine it's a, it, it looks like a pretty tall mountain to climb. And you're still praying, waiting for the Lord to, you know, send the woman he ordained for you right to your front porch. That's hard. It's hard, especially when you're looking at data sets, you know, like, you know, like this. Are you looking at a data set, right? That's that's rough. That's really rough. I mean, hell, I can show you. You want to talk about divorce? Somebody asked me about divorce. I have to, shit, sorry. This is a really too small to read. I'll come back to that. I'll, I'll actually push that up on screen. Hang on. Um, but you look at, I mean, you know, birth rates. Is a percentage of unmarried birth rates, right? Now that can make you pretty nihilistic. When you look at the average age of first marriage, that can make you pretty nihilistic. Oh, here's the divorces, by the way. I didn't throw this one up yet. Holy mackerel, look at that. Women using the pill and their divorce rates. <laughs> and, and divorce rates. So women started using the pill hmm, right around, oh gosh, I guess maybe I was wrong. Maybe it was right or, I guess, well, the sexual revolution was really 1965, but they started using the pill uh, probably around 1960. And then look at that. Look at the pill use versus the divorce rate. Wow, that's a, that's a hell of a, that's a hell of a red pill, fees. That's hard. How do I interpret that data? How, how, how should I interpret this data? Should I approach it from a negative nihilistic perspective or should I look at this and go, hmm, how can I use this and leverage this for, for good? How do I use my superpowers for good? Wow, that's a real, uh, really crazy spike. That's another really crazy spike right there. How do I use that to my best advantage? How do I use the SSR? Was it the uh, antidepressant drugs? That's, that's a what, what happened in 2010? 
It's a Scooby-Doo mystery. <laughs> uh, oh, speaking of divorce, uh, 144 years of marriage and divorce. World War II ends, boom, drops, and then look at that. It kind of spikes, and now it drops. Oh, that's great. Good news, guys. Except the marriage rate is also divorce, is dropping as well. So when you, people aren't getting married, people aren't getting divorced either. Makes sense because we still use marriage as the benchmark for all of our metrics. The loops here. Nobody is the absolute teacher. You guys need to stop listening to the gospel according to filling the guy's name that you watch online. Fill in that person. Say my name. His name online. You guys need to mature your minds. You're goddamn right. It hurts me so much how so many people they're like you can you listen to their them talk and I'm like yo I know exactly what channel you've been watching because you spouse all their talking points. They talking points for which you have no valid, real, concrete, empirical counter arguments for. Yeah, it goes against your old order belief set. I know it's tough, man. It's tough. That, and, and I think that the, the more we ignore it, the worse off we're going to be. Should we all be negative and nihilist? No, absolutely not. I, the, again, as I said before, the red, well, the red pill is, doesn't exist so that you will hate women or hate yourself for that matter. But it doesn't exist so you will hate women. It exists so you won't hate women for what they can never be to you. Knowing that, how are you going to move forward? What are the best practices? What should we do? How can we do that? How can I was just asked a minute ago? Well, if, if marriage is not an option or if marriage is a bad idea, contractually speaking, or the way we do it now, even though Rolla has his great marriage, right? But if he, even a guy with a great marriage is telling you that it's an unconscionable contract and I'm not against marriage, I am against the way we do it now. If I hear that from my guru, from that channel, I know where you're from. But if I hear that, then how do you respond to that? I don't even know how to respond to it, man. One guy got that kid just hits me up and says he's in his twenties. He wants to have kids. He doesn't know what to do because marriage is like a, a, a bad idea. And I'll tell you the other thing is I think that a lot of guys who are particularly in the trad con slash religious believers set, they want to, they want to say that guys are too, are overly concerned with lo losing half their shit, right? Don't get married because you don't get married because you'll lose half your shit. Right. Yo, 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 50% uh, of relationships uh, end up in divorce, uh, marriages, and you'll lose half your shit. And I don't want to lose half my shit. Or maybe she comes into the relationship with a lot of debt and now it's community debt. Now you're screwed. Right. Or maybe you married a single mother because you didn't believe in cuckoldry being uh, proactive or excuse me, reactive or proactive instead of reactive. <laughs> you know, pro, was it a retroactive and, 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 pro, and, and proactive? Maybe maybe she had the kid before you arrived. Oh, you're a superhero. Good for you. Bravo. You met her in single women's min or single mommy's ministry. Well, congratulations. You just completed her sexual mating her mating strategy. Well, okay. Well, but is that good or is that bad? Is it what well, depends on on who's interpreting it, right? I think it's not a good idea. And I think most guys have a hesitancy to get with someone who get with a woman who has children. That's a, just an, an innate thing in guys. Some guys can get over it because it's their only shot at reproducing. Well, uh, well how are you going to interpret that? Oh, that sounds nihilistic. Okay, but it can also sound really good too. How are you going to interpret the data? Who's going to make the judgment call? So when when I get this, uh, and I, I mentioned this even about Owen Cook, right? I said this on his on on Fresh and Fit not too long ago, and I've said it on this channel as well. Is people throw shit at me and throw rocks and whatever, run me up the flagpole, and they say, well. Rollo's truthful anger. He's everything he says is true because they have no counter argument to it. But if you listen to the, all that truth for too long, it'll make you unhappy. It will make you angry. It will make you hateful. It will make you resentful. If you read the rational mail too many times, if you listen to these guys too many times, if you, you're going to get nihilistic and despondent, would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? That's the difference. And that's what people, I said this on Stardust's show, but I'll, I'll repeat it here again. That is the question everyone on planet fucking Earth is going to have to answer in this century. Because 
this is this conflict right here and not just have, I'm picking on Hafiz today. Sorry. But I can say the same thing about Justin Baldoni or Baldini, whatever his name is. I can say the same thing about uh, Andrew Clavin. I can say the same thing about, um, you know, maybe Glenn Beck. I don't know. You name the guy. Name the name the personality. Anybody who, like uh, Stephen Crowder, Tim Pool, uh, who's, get, who's getting into red pill stuff now? Who's doing, who's the, uh, certainly uh, uh, Mike Rashid, who, Mike, I love you to death. But it's... <sighs> It's it's a it's a conflict of belief set, old order belief set, and new order data coming in and conflicting with that. And the the answer now is, oh man, this is going to make you nihilistic. It doesn't have to. It only makes you nihilistic because you can't process it, because you can't answer that kid's question that just that hit me up a minute ago. How do I have a kid and not get married? I don't know, but you're going to have to answer that. Would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? Would you rather stick your head in the sand and, and would you rather be plugged back into the matrix like cypher and mm, tasty steak? You know, it's not steak. <laughs> That's a problem. The problem is, remember when I remember when I did the, uh, the episode on the red pill lens and I said, once you put the red pill lens on, it doesn't come off. And usually right, right up to that point. Anyways, it was guys coming to the red pill because they found my material or they were in a point of crisis and they're like, Oh, I don't know what happened in that. You know, and I've got thousands of people literally, and I'm, I'm not making I'm not, I'm not exaggerating that. I have thousands of people saying that, you know, my material saved their lives. It took the gun out of their mouths. And again, people say, well, now Rolo thinks he's a Messiah by saving their lives. No, I didn't set out to do that. I didn't go, hey, I'm going to write the rational mail and see if I can get some guys to take the noose off their neck. I'm glad they do. I'm glad that was a byproduct of it. Absolutely. But I don't think I'm sent from the angel Gabriel, more like Lucifer Morningstar, but, <laughs> um, because I'm, I'm, I rattle people's cages with the data. I ask the wrong fucking questions, man. And that's the problem is you're having trouble answering those questions. When, again, the truthful anger thing, there was a point at which uh, guys were going, were reading my book. They were taking my book to uh, RSD seminars or whatever, you know, their hot seats or whatever the hell it was. And they would ask those instructors, what do you think of ra the rational male by Rolo Tomasi? He says this. Here's this data. Here's what he said. Oh, like, have you thought about this? And it got to the point where even Owen Cook, who came on the show with me, had to say, hey, we're going to have to listen to this and we're going to have to really break it down. He knew exactly what, you know, hypergamy doesn't care meant. And we got a good laugh out of that. I'm glad. It wasn't a poem, by the way. It was just me sort of rattling off. Like, um, actually, hypergamy doesn't care was me rattling off the most common reasons why guys broke up with their girlfriends or like what, what they would like tell me is like, I can't believe she left me. I was such a good dad. I can't believe she left me. We were, we set our vows in front of God and man. I can't believe she left me because I've got a great job. I can't believe she, like on and on all of those ones that said you know, that our hypergamy doesn't care in that, that post and that chapter, all of that. I didn't write those. I didn't just pull those out of my ass. Those came from guys, from other guys. That was the beauty of it. That wasn't a poem. That was a freaking documentary, man. That was an indictment of the hypergamy and guys need to know that. It's not so you'll be, you know, crying in your milk or your beer or whatever, <laughs> so that you won't make those mistakes. Arolo says that women can't love men. No, it's no, they can, but you've got to have a realistic perspective of what's going on. And if you don't, you're going to be at a severe disadvantage. That's why. Would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? Would you rather stick your head in the sand? Would you rather be plugged back into the matrix or would you rather know this stuff and like use that data to live a better life? or save your life even. That's the, that's the key here. So when I say, well, you know, you know, the, my, the red pill saves lives. We say that all the time. Game would have saved that guy. That guy would not have committed suicide, killed his wife and his kids because he got zeroed out at 45 years old, prime demographic for men's suicide. Um, and would not, that would not have happened had the guy known about game, had that guy not known about what, like, uh, what was it? Um, Thomas Ball. Thomas Ball was a, go look up Thomas Ball. I have a, uh, I think it was actually in preventive medicine or maybe it was positive masculinity. I, I explained the, the situation with Thomas Ball. And what Thomas Ball is, is he actually self-immolated 
on the court or the what was it city hall steps at the courtyard because he had his kids removed from him and he left this big long manifesto it was thomas ball and i think it was 2013 maybe it was earlier than that but he wrote this um he wrote this manifesto like a suicide note basically and he's the one thomas gave me the idea for being zeroed out and he gave me the idea for um the old set of rules versus the new set of rules because he said that it says you are brought up conditioned by the blue pill to believe in a certain rule set to believe believe in that everybody's playing by that that rule set and when you find out through his divorce and his custody and the kids being taken away and blah, blah, blah when you find out about that then you realize that other people are using a new rule set or they're using a different one than the one you were given when you were a kid. That's why I always call it the old book, the old books versus the new books, old order versus new order. This is where this comes from. Okay. So people think I just pulled this out of my ass. I'm not. And so I, I, I was reading this and the guy literally set himself on fire as sort of a, you know, to make a statement, he's going to kill himself anyways. And he's, you know, had a manifesto and all this other stuff about like, essentially, being taught the blue pill teaching and conditioning him to believe one thing until he got to a point of crisis and trauma and he couldn't deal with it because suddenly he realizes that they're not playing by the same set of rules that he was told everybody would be would it have been better for him to have been given the new set of rules would it have been would that have saved his life would it have saved him from pouring gas on himself and setting himself on fire thomas ball look it up would it have been better would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? In this case, I, I would argue that probably guys like Thomas Ball would be better off being right given that new data set. If it saves your life, then being right is probably the answer that you want. As I said, in the bitter taste of the red pill, which he's saying here, you're going to be better and misogynistic and well, okay. I said this as well. In, in the bitter taste of the red pill, which is a chapter in my, my first book, I explained this. I said, you know what? It's not about it's not about nihilism. It's not about um, it's not about uh, being bitter. It's about knowing better. And there can be hope. The problem is is that these guys, when they encounter this, they have no counter argument. They have no nothing to come back with. They can't give you an answer as to how to interpret this and live a better life accordingly. And he's not wrong. And Stardust is not wrong. There are many, many guys who would who kill themselves or blow themselves up or or become nihilistic and bitter and, and despondent because they don't see that you have a fundamentally better life with the new set of rules in your hands. They just don't know how to read it. They don't know how to use that discontent or deal with that discontent creatively rather than destructively. And that's really what he's going through right here because it's a challenge to his old order beliefs but guess what everyone on earth is going to take the red pill if they haven't already they're going to be unplugged everyone on planet earth is being unplugged everyone men women everyone and it ain't me that's doing it it's just it's it's <laughs> you know what's doing it it's this right here this is doing it okay that is what's doing it this is what's doing it. Okay. That's what's doing it. Not me. Not the, your favorite YouTuber, not the guy that, that makes, makes guys ask you the questions you can't answer. It's data. It's social media. Oh, take a break from it. Get away, get outside. Yeah. Because you know why? Because it removes you from all that data that you can't process. But the, here, here's the thing is you can't avoid it anymore. The genie's out of the bottle. You can't go plug yourself. You can't be cypher. You can't plug yourself back into the matrix, Hafiz. There is no man besides God who knows the truth of every single woman. There is a lot of women. There is a large diversity of women. There is American women. There is Eastern women. There are Muslim women. There are Jewish women. There are conservative women. There By the way, I'm not sure I would use the, where is that? every single woman there is a lot of women there is a large diversity of women there is american women there is eastern women there are muslim i'm not sure i would use that picture for muslim women i'm just a beautiful girl i'm wrong 
She got those. She got that eye thing going, man. What is it, ladies? What the hell is the cat eye thing going on? Torsha, maybe you can answer this question. What the hell? I see every chick on planet Earth doing that little that little. Is it was it Adele that did that? <laughs> Some women. There are Jewish women. There are conservative women. There are liberal. There's so many different types. Mm. And while yes, there are cross cultural things that bond a lot of people. There is not absolutes. Like for example, so many guys believe if you're with a girl and Drake comes along, she's leaving you guaranteed because that's what female nature talks. These are like the most textbook guys. They live. Okay, so I, I I feel your pain, Hafiz. I get you because we get this all the time. I I don't know how to explain this any different than hypergamy is not a straight jack, and I've said I've done that episode several times. Yeah, they they do. They take it to the extreme, the nth degree, because they don't know how to process it. That's why they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to deal with discontent, and so they go, well, you know, why bother getting married? Because Drake will come along and take your girl. No, that, that's that's moronic and 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 it shows a fundamental lack of actually what hypergamy is, which of course you you don't understand either because you still use that old school you know caste system definition for it. But the 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 fact of the matter is is like yeah that that's what these guys are seeing. So I, I agree, but I would say that that it's not that's not the only thing. Now the other part of this is that he just made the fallacy of individuation. There's Jewish women, there's Muslim women, and there's liberal women, and there's right wing women, and there's this woman, and there's that woman, and da 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 da. Yeah. Okay. But what's the one commonality they have? They're all women. Okay. It's like, remember, I, what was it? Uh, like hyperstophilia, right? Hyperstophilia, like, uh, oh man, that's horrible. Women, the women with hyperstophilia, that's a personality disorder. That's a, that's a psychological something that's wrong. Something's wrong. They're damaged, right? Yeah but they're all women. <laughs> it's nothing, but there's only one sex that's real. I mean, overwhelmingly, if not uniquely, the ones who get that, <laughs> get hybristophilia, which of course, hybristophilia is that women have a, an, an instinctive evolutionary attraction to men who are violent, incarcerated killers, Anders Brevik, right? Uh, with, with the Boston Marathon mob bomber kid, right? He's got a teenage fan club. Nicholas Cruz, they want to bang him. Now they want to have, now the women want to have sex with him. They didn't want to before because he was a loser. Now he goes and shoots guns down people. And now suddenly women want to get with him. James Holm, that guy, the guy who was the uh, Aspen theater shooter from way, from way back in the day. I remember when that was like the, the worst freaking like mass shooting in a while. And that guy is like, he's, he's just like, the dude's nuts. And you know what? I mean, he's, I mean, it looks nuts too. Women still, hey, I'm writing him fan mail in the in the you know jail. Hey, I'd love to get with you in a conjugal visit. <laughs> yeah, because there are still commonalities. Again, lie of fallacy of individuation. We're all are we all unique snowflakes? Or are we all the same? Well, that's the same binary understanding that you are railing against here. So when we talk about like how, you know, men are, <laughs> we are more different than we are alike. Men and women are more different than we are alike. But they're also this is that we have biological things that make us men and make us women. That's it. And you have to accept those things. We have, we have the data. <laughs> we have the evidence. We have the, we have the evidence right here. How are you going to interpret that? Well, everybody's different. Well, I'm glad you feel that way. And, you know, on an individual you know, perspective it is, but from a general perspective from, let's see where to go, because we're going to go back to now, now again, from that middle of the bell curve perspective, where we have a lot more commonalities to those, to those sexes. So when we say, well, women are hypergamous. Yeah, they are. But are all women able to exercise that hypergamy to its ultimate, most extreme uh, ability? No, of course not. Because there's fat, there's fat chicks and there's skinny chicks. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe the thin chicks and the in shape chicks, they can, maybe Drake's going to come and swoop your woman. He's going to take your girl. A fat chick, you know, well, maybe the old chick, maybe the this chick, whatever. And that, maybe that's not going to happen. But it doesn't change the, it doesn't change the fact. Women are hypergamous. Doesn't nothing stops there. That's a commonality. 
So what's the general and what's the specific? And when you just focus on the specific, you're only looking at the outliers on either end of that bell curve. All women are hypergamous. Men, of course, on the up. You know, it's funny. You probably agree with me about this. Men's innate mating strategy is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. And now we would get into the, the reason why pornography is so prevalent today. And you go, yeah, right. Men should stop porn. Yeah. You would agree with me, but I say all women are hypergamous. It's alpha fucks and beta bucks. And you, you know, this, you misunderstand that. No, we're all individuals. How come I can't be an individual guy and say, you know what? Not everybody is going to want to stroke off to midget porn, right? Not everybody's like, I can make it this specific, stupidly, absurdly specific about guys. And Bill, well, you know, but porn's a bad thing. Okay. If that's your, if that's your take, fine. But if I go and I say, well, you know, um, social media is just as addicting as pornography for women as pornography is for men. Well, you know, women are all, there's Muslim women and there's conservative women and there's Christian women and there's Jewish women. That that's not a, that's not an argument. In fact, that's a, that's a dodge. If anything, there are things that are predictable about men and women. There's things that are predictable about our natures. Do we have choice? Yeah, of course we do. Can we go? Can we be the and can we be the outlier that makes a different choice? According, of course we can. We can even we can train ourselves to go on hunger strike. We can kill ourselves by starving ourselves. Our in, but it doesn't mean that our operative state is damn. I'm hungry. We can do that. We can we can use our will to end our lives. That's the most. That's that that right there should show you that yeah we can go certainly go against the machine and we can go against our 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 innate programming for self-preservation easily <laughs> people do it all the time men do it more than women but the fact remains is you'll still get hungry and that's common that's common to the machine women have a have a set of commonalities that refer to women hypergamy is one of those men men are more horny than women that's a commonality for guys Men would rather hit it and quit it. Men don't have, uh, men and women don't process emotions the same way. Exactly what I told Ariella. But it's like, it's like I've been sent by the angel Lucifer to explain to you human nature. What are you going to do with it, right? The devil never needs to lie if the truth serves a better purpose. Is, <laughs> if the truth is more impactful than the lie. That's much better. Never have to by all these rules that they read in somebody's book that has no footnotes. It hurts me to see how no footnotes. I have lots of footnotes. How many young men are being deceived today and you're living your life based upon someone's lie. One of my favorite conversations this, this uh, month was with Rob Henderson. We talked about luxury beliefs and how so many people believe ideas that are espoused by other people and those ideas destroy their lives while these other people don't even live out what they tell you. Oh, A lot of these content creators and people that... A lot of these guys. Just say it, man. Really, it's okay. Say fresh and fit. Say Kevin Samuels. Come on, say... Give, give me one name at least. You're, learning from and teaching about female nature they're not even believing what they're even telling you no they are they might not be practicing it but they are believing it right again belief is it belief belief of what they're just uh, okay i can't speak for anybody else if it's me you're talking about which i don't know maybe i maybe not but i'm giving you data right here's the here it is right oh wait hold on this is a really good one Sexless marriages. Oh my God. I didn't, I didn't make this infographic. I wish I had. I just report the news, man. People got, but that, but that becomes a, that becomes an article of faith, an article of belief, because that's the only language that believers know how to speak. They're not even living their lives in congruency to the message that they're communicating. But you young men are having to believe it. You young men are having to suffer. You're having to be deceived. And that pisses me off. Like anything in life. Receive. Reject. Redeem. Some things you receive. Oh, that's true. Some things you reject. No, 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 that's not true. And some things you redeem. I can see where you're coming from, but I got I to gotta add a little twist to this to really make this better. Men, 
Don't just be a parrot. Don't just believe in absolutes. Actually go into the real world and learn the truth for yourself. And whether it's me, whether it's Jordan Peterson, whether it's Gary Vee, all my favorite people, don't just believe everything that we say. Research and pray about it yourself. But see, that's the problem, Hafiz. They are listening to you. And they are listening to Jordan. And God forbid, Gary Vee, right? They are listening to those guys and they still have questions that you don't have answers for, man. Brother, I, I feel you. I, I understand the frustration. I really do. But again, would you rather be happy? Would you rather be right? Oh, what's this is truth. This is that truth. Again, we're going to like this. This is the language of believers. And that was the language that Ariella had in um, in in the first episode or in the, the beginning of today's show when I was on You Are Here. Now. Hafiz is approaching this from certainly an event, probably most likely a Baptist slash evangelical Christian perspective. I know he's been on Roos Lawn, so I kind of get an idea. Okay. Now the difference is Ariella most definitely is. Uh, let's just be let's just be honest. Ariella is Jewish. Okay. I mean that's pretty easy to figure out, or at least she may probably ethnically at, at the very least. Okay. So, <laughs> but her her. Her religion is really astrology. It's the secret. It's the law of attraction. It's chick crack is what her religion really is, but it's still a belief. So we're looking at two different belief sets, but we're hearing commonalities between the, the same language anyways, I should say, commonalities in the language. Well, then the things aren't always like that. Women can be men and men can be women too. Now, he would probably disagree with that, but it's the same as saying, you know, well, don't believe everything, you know, live your truth. Okay. I'm living my truth. Okay. Well, what's your truth? My truth is the gospel word of God. The Bible is the unerring word of God. That's your truth. Now, Ariella would say, well, my truth is that, you know, what's your sign? <laughs> Are you an Aries? <laughs> right. That's, that's her truth. Um, uh, she even it was very em em empathetic, or em empath, what is it? Emphasized. Em she was like, oh yeah, the, the law of attraction is true, man. It's a law. No, it's not. No, it's not. Please. It's fantasy. It's it's magical thinking. And, and people need magical thinking. Let me let me explain that. I, will, I, I don't think that magical thinking is necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. I think it's just a thing. And how we use it is 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 really, you know, the devil's in the details kind of thing. But I mean, he's right. I mean, go go go. Now, how many how many guys are gonna go, you know what? Hmm. I heard Jordan Peterson. I heard Roll Tomasi. I heard Gary Vee. I heard this dude. I heard Fresh and Fit. I heard these guys. Like, the, the thing is, is that most people don't develop their belief set based on what other people are telling them. Okay. They don't. They don't. They certainly don't go and, you know, men, most people don't create their, they don't. If you ask people, like, where'd you come to that thinking? Where'd you, who, where'd you get your values from? I'm pretty sure they wouldn't say, well, I, read the research of nine, you know, peer reviewed experiments that were replicable and uh, they were independently funded by the, by Texas A&M university. And, and no, nobody does that. You get them through lived experience. So he is right about that, but you have to go out there and do it. Right. And I think what he's upset about is that again, the truth that is being well, at least that he doesn't have answers for, he sees it as being sort of like this cult, right? People are, people keep coming at me with the same question that I don't have an answer for. Where is it coming from? <gasps> that guy who thinks he's been sent by the angel Gabriel. Because that's the only context. Like the belief is the only context they can really interpret this stuff in. And the last truth about female nature is that somebody is winning and why not you? So when I asked you the question at the beginning of the video, I asked you, I said, how is that a truth about female nature? Most people are living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. Some people are living financially free. What do you want to be? Though the reality and the numbers show that most people are going to suffer, most people don't want to be most people. Most men don't want to be the statistics. Most men want to be the man who is leading, not the man who is suffering. You see, so many people spew information about marriage, about women, about dating to discourage people. But my biggest thing is that there's somebody out there who's winning. Okay. 
Is it to discourage people? Because I'll tell you what, I mean, the marriage rate is still, I mean, it's in the shitter, don't get me wrong. And the fertility rate is below replacement level. But it sure as hell isn't because of guys who have been in the manosphere, guys who have been in this context for the last two years. As I've shown you throughout this show, it started right around the sexual revolution. And those numbers have been in constant decline since then. Now, I'm, I'd be flattered if you thought that the two-year-old Roald Tomasi was that influential back then, but I'm, I, trust me, I wasn't in 1970, right? So the, 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 the problem here is not so much the, the, the source of where these guys are getting it, but it's the fact that it's happening at all. The fact is that we are all going to have to face that question. Would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? Would you rather use this data to, you know, make yourself a better life or are you going to use it to put a noose around your neck? And it ain't me that's doing it and it ain't you that's doing it. It's everybody. And we have, uh, we have an access to information that we never had in ages past. Yes, there's a lot of people who are struggling, but there are men who are succeeding. There are men who are happily married, like my father, like Jordan Peterson, like Pastor Mark Driscoll, like Patrick Bed David. And, and uh, don't use Pastor Mark Driscoll. I'll tell you why. And so many men who I've encountered in my life. There's a lot of men who are doing well. Not everyone's struggling. Not everyone's dealing with liabilities and headaches and knuck if you buck chicks. Not everybody is suffering. Why not you? If someone's going to have a beautiful family, why not you? If someone's going to leave a legacy and be able to raise their children in a healthy house with a supportive wife, why not you? You see? All right. Well, it made me do it. Uh, where did it go? Is this the one? There we go. Is that it? Uh, or was this it? Let's see. Okay, so this is a um, oh, god damn it. I thought she had her credentials on there. She's an evolutionary psychologist. She's quoting from a research that she did. A 40-year-old woman will have better luck messaging a 25-year-old man, 60% re reply rate, than she would a 55-year-old one, 36% reply rate. When women message men, they're actually more likely to get a response from younger men than they are from older ones, really. Here we go. Age gaps in dating are mostly driven by men. By the time they're 55, men send more than half the messages to women at least eight years their junior. <laughs> but though men tend to be the most attracted to 22-year-olds forever, they do end up dating people in their own age range. Okay. Two-thirds of male messages go to the best-looking third of women. So basically, guys are fighting each other for two to one for, for the absolute best rated females, while plenty of potentially charming and even cute girls go unwritten. The medical term is called male pattern madness, right? But then again, messages sent versus messages received or, or, or versus messages received by straight users. We can look at this. Uh, I mean, I can show you data set after data set. I mean, do I really need to? The problem is, is like, why not you? Well, this is why not you. The, stat, the stats might say, this is why not. Do you need to, now, again, this is not to make anybody, you know, despondent or nihilistic. It's simply, a, it's a statement of fact. What are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? Now, I was presented earlier with the question of, well, ideally, I would like to be happy and I would like to be right. Good. That's the right fucking answer. That's the answer. I would rather be happy and right. Good. But you got to be right before you can be happy. Because you have to go through what is right and what's tough to deal with. Okay? I said this again in The Bitter Taste of the Red Pill, that chapter in book one. The truth will, the truth shall set you free. Set you free. But it doesn't absolve you of the responsibility and the liabilities that that truth is locked into that truth that is part of that truth i sorry i'm gonna get on my freaking podium and i'm gonna give you a sermon here at the very end okay the truth will set you free but it doesn't make it pretty and it doesn't make it taste better and it doesn't make emotional sense and you know what that truth will most likely conflict with your belief sets usually and even and if it doesn't 
it will turn those beliefs and that faith into fact, and it you which is a good thing as far as I'm concerned because people say, well, uh, you know, the red pill confirms everything I believed in the Old Testament or my, the Quran or whatever, right? Yeah, but now is it faith or was it that they were just smart guys? Because it, it ceases to be divine at that point. It ceases to be an article of faith because it's right there. Why? Why was it not faith? I don't. If I can see it, like, hey, look, I have faith that this cup is right here. Oh, here it is. Holy crap. It's no longer an article of faith. And that's another thing that's really tough for guys to sort of wrap their heads around. And again, people are being unplugged by hook or by crook, kicking and screaming. Guys like Hafiz and his friends are going to be dragged into the 21st century. And they're going to have to deal with old order thinking versus new order thinking. And part of that is how can I be happy with this new data? Congratulate. Well, good news. We're trying to figure that out together. Come on, join us. And we're going to do, we're going to try to figure out how this 20 year old kid can have kids and we can reform marriage. We still think that monogamy and, you know, parental investment is a good idea because that's an evolutionary truth, but we're going to have to figure something else out. We're going to have to figure something, you know, for at least an arrangement where men and women can have this compromise together so that men don't get fucked and women don't get fucked. How can we do that? I don't know, but we're all going to get together and we're gonna talk about it unless you're going to tell all these guys to exit the fucking room because you are so locked in to that old, you're still clinging to your fucking pearls, man. You're still clinging to your security blanket. We don't have that discussion if you have this discussion right here. That's the problem. You're the fucking obstacle at that point. If you're going to tell everybody, hey, go outside, do this, you know, go feel happy, go feel better. Go to your cope, right? Whatever your cope is, go, go into your escapism. I don't care what it is. And sometimes escapism is not always porn or, or drugs or alcohol or anything else. It can be lots of different things. It can be religion. It can be whatever. But until we all get together, until people like have this rational, reasonable, you know, hey, we got all this data. It's really pretty depressing. How can we make it not depressing? How can we leverage this to have a better situation between men and women? using the facts and everything that we know. Well, we don't have that conversation if we're all freaking out because it conflicts with our, you know, ego investments. I'm not negating the realities. Yes, you I are. I understand the realities. I understand the dark sides of life. I understand that there is suffering. There is heartbreak. There are people who've been through hell and back. I'm not negating that. But my biggest thing is if someone's going to win, why not me? If someone's going to put in the work to be successful, why not me? If there is someone out there who can make a man happy and be respectful, why can't I find that person? That is the energy that I want you men to be on moving into 2022. It is time to reject the nihilism. One of the biggest blessings of my life. And the only way we do that is by accepting the real. The only way we do that is by saying, would you rather be happy or would you rather be right? And we say, we'd rather be right. Great. Now, how do we go from being right to being happy? Because right now, you're just saying, hey, everybody, just think happy thoughts. Think positivity, man. Just be good about it, right? Don't ignore all these stats. Ignore all this stuff. Ignore those guys who think they have a cult or something like that. Build yourself up. Of course, he listens to Gary Vee. Of course, he listens, probably listens to Tony Robbins, right? Hey, man, build yourself up. Ignore the, the haters. Keep going. You know, put yourself first. <sighs> what? Oh. The minute you deny that, the minute you start thinking, well, we've got to go magical thinking because that's the way that, that, you know, the only way out of this whole thing, because the truth is, is sucks, man. It tastes bad. Yeah, it does. But how can we make it taste better? How can we, how can we build it up? How can we use this data to build a better life? It's not the nihilism you need to worry about. It's how you're going to interpret all of that, all of this empirical understand this new order understanding and make it work. You don't know how to make it work. And then I'm not saying I do either, but we got to figure it out. And I tell you, I can tell you how it ain't going to work is by calling people, calling bullshit, right? It's, it's by, by getting, jumping into this, you know, Hey guys, let's get in a pep rally and feel better about ourselves. No, you can jump right off a cliff, right? Because the cliff is part of being right. Not being happy. Well, that'd be happier if I could jump off this cliff. All right, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Life was me learning me improving and me getting exactly what I wanted. And I created all the tools on the, in the roommates to help you men win 
and to help you men be successful. Mm. That's what the roommates is all about. It's about men who want to get better because I wrote it down. I wrote this down in a post on YouTube community tab. I said, there's two teams of men. There's team bitter and there's team better. There's team bitter who wants to complain and be cynical and mm. point about everything that's wrong. Mm. And there's team better who understands the, the, the consequences. Yes. And you know what? Team better doesn't do jack shit until they can interpret the data and find methodologies to make it work. And then maybe they can help team bitter. Maybe then, then, then that's how, maybe that's the way. But we're not going to get there if we're still pumping up, you know, positivity hustlers. Who understands the darkness, but they believe that if there's good out there, they can build themselves up as a man to achieve it. So I pray that you guys. All right. So that's enough of that. All right. He, he puts a pitch for his for his his program as how, how to be masculine, how to be a man. Right. He, because he gives everybody shit. And then I, like in the beginning and the end, I, I cut it out. But in the beginning and the end, he's gives his sales pitch so just know that that's there all right so uh let me see if i can pick up here mm -mm -mm -mm. again now i think a lot of people are gonna say well you're down on religion you're down on this well, no not at all in fact i'm gonna explain something to you here at the end that, that will sort of whose ex-girlfriend was depressed all the time she wanted to cure it via astrology and rock energy you mean like chris like brazilian power crystals I stayed up leveling up. You are saving my life. Good. Yeah. Because I'm giving you tools. I'm not giving you like pep rallies. I give guys tools. And part of that, sometimes those tools, sometimes that data looks pretty bleak. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can interpret it that way. As I said before, discontent is defines the human condition. I told, uh, I told this to, um, to Elijah on, uh, when I did the interview on, um, what was it? on uh, slightly offensive i told him this i said i do not believe and I, i'll tell you the same thing i do not believe that men are men and women will ever be content to be discontent is part of the human condition how we deal with that discontent is what makes you a man makes you a woman right that's 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 what defines your character that's what defines because like, you're never going to be content like you say oh i can be content in the lord well good okay um, besides metaphysical besides the higher power thing Besides God coming down and being content with the Lord, great, okay? The Lord can give you contentment. Okay, awesome. But while you're here and while you're alive, you're going to be discontent, even in your success, even when you're the winner. Why not me? Why not you? Because once you get there, you're still going to be discontent. You're still going to fight. You're not going to find contentment in another woman. You're not going to find contentment in a job. You're not going to find contentment in a lot of money. You're not going to find contentment in a car. Because even as awesome as those things are, and I'm not saying don't get those things, right? I would love to have a Dodge Hellcat, but uh, I know that I won't be content with it because once I get to that, I'll go, okay, what's next? I'm going to get a degree. I'm going to get a doctorate in whatever, philosophy, sh chakras, I don't know, whatever you like, right? I'm going to get a doctorate. Okay, great. Once you get that degree, then you're like, hmm, yeah, this is great. Yeah, maybe you feel pretty content for first three months because you're benefiting from the rewards of whatever it was that you worked your ass off to get to, but then you're like, okay, what's the next mountain to climb? What can I do now? Well, well, that was, maybe that was one aspect of my life that I'm content in because I got there, but now I'm really discontent in other aspects of my life. Discontent defines the human condition, period. Now, this is not Jordan Peterson bullshit where it's like, well, life is suffering and you just have to mitigate that suffering. No, you can succeed and you can thrive with discontent. Discontent is a good thing. The difference is, and the difference in my, my, my perspective, anyways, at least it seems to me, this is best practices, is that you can deal with discontent either creatively or destructively. Nihilism, despondency, most definitely destructive. You can sedate yourself. You can, if you're not where you want to be in life, if you think life sucks, whatever, I've told you guys this a thousand times it's here and on rule zero. You are, you get to decide who you want to be. Don't believe me? Go look at Ricky Berwick, man. Ricky Berwick. Oh my Lord. If you don't know who Ricky Berwick is, you need to go look him up on YouTube right now or look him up on Twitter. I think he might even be on Instagram too. Like the dude has muscular dystrophy. I believe, I don't know what the hell he has. Muscular dystrophy. And the dude is just like, you know, he looks like he's in pain all the time. But that dude is the funniest motherfucker on the internet. 
I mean, the dude has made something of it. Like out of that, that's a lot of discontent. Trust me. In his physical state, that's probably a lot of, you could sit there and just go, well, life sucks and I can't wait to die. Or you can be Ricky Berwick and you can make, a, he's probably one of the most popular, you know, uh, content creators. Like, I don't even, is he on TikTok? I don't even know where Ricky Berwick is on. I know he's on YouTube, but go look him up. You will laugh your ass off. Some of it's kind of like, you know, humor, but the guy laughs at his condition and he's making probably, he's probably making a hundred thousand dollars, Hafiz. <laughs> he's probably making a lot more than that because he, he turned himself around. He's not, he don't care. Like you're in Ricky Berwick's position. You're probably not, your highest priority is not getting laid, but he has made a lot for him. He had done a lot with that. Okay. And I, he's just one example that I can think of off the top of my head, but that's discontent. And he used, he was creative with it. You know, maybe he wouldn't say I'm a goof for saying this, but he's been creative in his discontent and he's thrived as a result of it. So it's not, Oh, I got to manage suffering. No, that's not what it is. It's how do I use discontent to live a better life? Well, I can tell you the first step, understand your reality. That's it. Understand what can you, what you can do, where you're at, what your strengths are, assess your strengths, assess your weaknesses, assess where you're at, be situationally aware, and then go from there. That's how you do it. That would be my advice to young men, you know, uh, mental point of origin, accept the fact that you have a burden of performance, accept that you will always be discontent and you need to be creatively discontent. That's a good thing, as I said. So that is what I will leave you with today. Uh, let me see where is this. Oh, I, I got a, I got one more point here. <sighs> Dude, really? Okay, whatever. Here you win. Here's 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 okay. Here's my advice. If you really want to get married, if you really want to make it work, go propose to an Indian woman in Delhi. Apparently, that's the place to go. But do watch India's Sons before you do. Um, let's see, Bradford. Bradford. The data causes cognitive dissonance, Rolo. Yes, it does. That's why they are having issues with it. Yeah. And the more they get into, like, like content pro producers, <laughs> content creators who discover the red pill or have it forced upon them by their audience are having to deal with it. And this is what you get, right? We have to embrace the reality the data is pointing to and learn how to deal with it and how to use it creatively. Thank you. Yes, there is a way out of hell, Hafiz. There is a way out of nihilism. There's a way out of despondency. There's a way out of suicide. There's a way out of all that team bitter. There's a way out. Yes, but it's not about pep rallies. And it's not about woo -woo, magical Brazilian power crystals. It's not about magical thinking. It's about using the data to its best effect and coming up with best practices. That's what it is. That's why I said like, I don't have an answer as to like, well, how can we have kids and how can we form families and be parentally invested? And how can we deal with hypergamy and how can we deal with all this stuff? I can tell you how we don't deal with it. We don't deal with it with fucking astrology. That's how we don't deal with it. We can not deal with it with MBTI. We can deal with it not with the secret and the law of attraction. That's how we don't deal with it. That's how we step backwards into the dark fucking ages because we are, we have this inability to, to reconcile our discontent. So the best, the only way most people know, especially the believers know, is to fall back on more magical thinking. Well, you know, well, I, I hope you can do it. Hopium, right? That's a religion too. Emotionalism. Yeah, there you go. Well, uh, whatever your religion is, whatever your spirituality is, whatever your shaman says, I don't know. That's the way not to do it. Because that will lead to a disaster, a recipe for disaster. That is, you're right. Cognitive dissonance. Thank you for bringing that up, Bradford. Bradford. All right. Am I down here? Let me keep going. Thank you, Sam Botta, for being on the game today. And Bob's in the gene. Yeah, where is Torsha today? I don't know. I haven't seen Torsha at all today. People ask me about Torsha. No, she's not my daughter. She's older, way older than my daughter. Yeah, a bit older than my daughter. Torsha is my assistant. She's my magician's assistant, to put it that way. Do I consider her my girlfriend? Now, some of them I consider girlfriends, and some of them I just consider. 
No. I like Torsha. I think she has potential. Potential. We'll see. I want to believe. <laughs> mm, oh, there we go. Hi, Michael. Uh, Aristotle called Laconia, Sparta, mm -hmm. and its women Gynocatria. Gynocatria. Uh, Spartan mothers would tell their sons, come home with a shield in hand or lay dead upon it. Oh, you saw 300 too. Yep. It's a good movie, though. You know, it took me a while to appreciate 300. I mean, I, it was like kind of homoerotic, let's be honest, but it was a pretty, pretty fun movie. Uh, all these women are crazy in my book. The good women find I find are the ones who seem not crazy. Yeah, and they're all taken. <laughs> uh, trios, trio, trio. If these guys can't see that women in the church are the same, they're willfully ignorant or growing up. Now they want to believe that they're not. They want to believe that they're in because it re is reaffirming of the belief set. Oh, not my girls, not my religion. And you know what? It's not just Christians too, by the way. Not my culture, not my ethnicity, not my religion. The girls in my, they know they better shape up. No, they're still women. They're still hypergamous. Whether they can express that, whether they can manifest that, whether they can leverage hypergamy for, within that social religious context is another thing, but they're still hypergamous. Never part of a youth group. Uh, I've seen everything you talk about multi in multiple churches. Thanks. Yeah, do go get religion. Mm. Most men do not want to be millionaire bosses. They just want peace. Well, then there should be a lot of peaceful guys. <laughs> There's some really blissful, peaceful dudes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Keep going. Man, you guys have been active. I have not been paying attention. <laughs> Did he? He sold his soul to the devil. Devil. I joke about it. I do. I joke about it. I'm Lucifer for bloody morning star. <laughs> no. No, but I'm happy to. I'm happy. I'm glad you think so. I'm glad people think I'm a cult leader. It makes my work a lot easier. Women come and go. You are forever. <laughs> yep. Rolo, great show. Thank you. This kid is injecting hopium. <laughs> uh, would you like to see, would love to see you and Coach Greg Adams collab, by the way, you rock. That's probably not going to happen, but um, thanks for the, the compliment on uh, F and F. Um, what'd you say? Oh, you meant Pook. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I've done a show on Pook before in case everybody wanted to know about that. Okay, uh, let's see. Now we're going to play fast and loose. Awesome as always. How are you doing tonight? I am doing great, but I'll get better. Um, I'm doing all right. I, I got to go put up fucking Christmas lights. <laughs> um, I have not, I've, I've been, I've been traveling so much in the last like three weeks. I have not been able to like, I, I usually do the decorations on the outside. I'm pretty damn good at it too. I will not pay anybody to um, do my Christmas lights. I'm glad to say I can still do that. You know, it's funny. Uh, Ed Lattimore had this had this had this tweet. I, it was either a tweet or is on his Instagram. He says, "The older you, get, if, if you're in good shape, like the older you get, and you're in good shape, the bigger a flex it is." I thought that was great because people are like, "You're how old are you?" When I was out in Texas, when I was out in Dallas, people were like were asking me how old I was. I'm like, "I'm 53." They're like, "Because I'm not fat." And I'm in at least reasonably good shape. I'm like to think I am. It is. It's a flex. The better in shape you are and the older you get, the bigger a flex it is. <laughs> I think so. Anyways. Okay, guys. This will this will do. I think that was enough. I think I've spoken for a long time. Too much. All right. Uh, did I get to everything? Um, see, I have my notes right here. Uh, let's see. What else did I get to? I think I got to pretty much everything. You know what I didn't get to? I didn't get to the postpartum depression chick. Postpartum pandering. I'll get to that. Maybe I'll do that as a chick talk video because it was really on TikTok is where that was from. I think I'll do that as a short form. Uh, you probably know who I'm talking about. The, the chick with the baby. Like, it doesn't even look like a real baby, but it's, uh, I talked about this on my first episode of You Are Here, um, which was on Wednesday. And um, there was a, we were talking about this chick who was, uh, she, she has a, a pretty well-watched uh, chick talk video or chick talk profile. Very, every, all of using every filter she can on her face. 
Um, apparently she was also one of these girls who was on like 16 and pregnant. Was that a show? I think that was a show. And now she's 21 and have her second child. And, you know, on, on TikTok, all she does is talk shit about her baby daddy. And he was this and he was that. And then if you look at like some of the video of the guy that I don't know if they're married, but I, I think maybe it is the baby, the new baby daddy. And he's like doing dishes and he's like, you know, changing diapers. And she's like, yeah, while well, she's like dancing around on TikTok. And then we're supposed to believe that she is sincerely having postpartum depression because she has to go back to work and leave her wonderful baby and how horrible it is. And I will tell you this, I saw that video on, 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 uh, on Tinder, or no, excuse me, on Tinder, on, uh, on Twitter. And, um, like everybody, like, I mean, it, it, it triggered so many women, like, especially like on the conservative side of things, it's like, oh, we, and even on the liberal side of things, like women are like, oh, we need pregnancy leave. And, you know, we need more money for women who've given birth and we need should be supporting this and everything. And I'm, I, so I'm like, it doesn't smell right. So I went, <laughs> so, you know, me being the asshole, right? I'm, I always have to fuck things up for people. So I go to TikTok and I look at her TikTok page and I go, yeah, this is pandering. You guys realize this is bait, right? Well, what she's saying is right, you know, because she's hitting that emotional nerve. Like all women can really like that's that resonates with women. Like, oh, I gotta leave my baby. Oh, I gotta leave my baby. Fuh, 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 fuh. And women go, oh, she has to leave her baby. You are being used, man. Why didn't I think of that? I wish I could do that. I can't do that as a guy, obviously. But that's a great. You want engagement? <laughs> Make sure you insert your link into that one, boy, because that was very well. Why I don't know what the kind of engagement the tweet got, but boy, and people came at me too when I said, you know, you realize she had her baby. She's already been, had a baby with a guy out of wedlock already. She's got this simp blue pill guy who's like sort of pandering to her and is a stay at home dad kind of thing. And every other video she has on her TikTok channel, like the guys are like, she's just like dancing around, like showing her cooter and everything. Well, showing her ass whatever she's already got a son who's like i think 10 or 12 I'm, how old is a kid now right by now but man <laughs> but you, you again you break that fantasy that it feels good well it feels bad but it's that it feels good to like you know oh you know I'm, i can emote and it's like watching titanic right and then the rational male comes in and says you realize this is bullshit right <laughs> and they're playing with your emotions no they're not <laughs> Successful dude, 33, got owned in, by Independent X. She did a number on me. How does one go about making it past the destroyed ego that these broads are so good at doing? Also, HMU in Houston. Uh, oh, yep. Uh, January, bro, love. Okay, yeah, I will be. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, maybe, I Thank you for the 20 bucks. We're kind of at the end here, so I don't want to dig too deep, but... Uh, Somebody asked me that if I was going to do a Q and A, I'll tell you why I, I'm hesitant to do Q and A's these days. Um, but we'll we'll get to that. Um, before I before we go though, uh, I will be at um, the Rebel Capitalist. Uh, that's my next appearance, by the way. Rebel Capitalist uh, live in Houston. That will be uh, January seventh through the 9th. I am going. I'm currently in discussions with uh, George Gammon right now to see if I can do a workshop style style thing while i'm there uh if not you can certainly just catch catch me in the lounge or whatever I'm, I'm just attending right now as a as a guest as a vip guest and um i'll probably i will definitely be there with robert kiyosaki if i can do something with robert I, i'm gonna see if i can work something out that might be might be good i just had that as an idea right now um but uh, i will answer your question uh Mason x uh when i do a q a okay you go to the front of the lot you go to the front of the class when i do that I'll do a Q&A. You guys want me to do a Q&A? I'll do a Q&A. Um, I usually don't do Q&As because uh, they're not, first of all, they're not very well viewed. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to have the super chats. Great. But um, it's, uh, I, I think that they ha they're very specific. So I'll do a Q&A. You guys want me to do a Q&A? I'll do one. Maybe I'll do it Wednesday. You want me to do a live one on Wednesday? A Q&A right here, right here in our show. Maybe on Wednesday I'll do it. Um, I also, by the way, if you want a personal q and I also have a Patreon group, which is on a, a monthly Zoom, which, by the way, if you're part of, we're going to be doing it, uh, I'm going to say Thursday, which is, what date is that? Thursday is, um, let's see, Thursday is the 16th, I believe, right? Yeah, okay, so the 16th, um, and that's if, and that's tentative. 
Uh, maybe I'll do it. Man, maybe I'll do it Wednesday. I don't know. Um, anyways, I've got my Patreon group that's coming up. I've got, uh, I think about 15 guys now. Uh, it is the $200 tier on my Patreon. It's the only $200 tier I have. And the only reason I do that is because it's a once a month thing. Uh, I have tons of guys hitting me up for one-on-one -on -one counseling, which I still do. And if I haven't gotten back to you on your email about that yet, I will now that I'm back from my, my travels. So uh, expect a, a return email uh, probably by tomorrow morning, by Monday morning. Um, but if you are a part of my Patreon group and you don't have to necessarily be the 200 level, but I do have a Patreon, uh, you can find all the links in the description, uh, below, uh, please like this video, please, you know, push me <laughs> tacos for the algorithm. Um, and then tell your friends that actually the best way to, uh, help me out with, uh, with this channel and it's free to do is just copy the URL and put it as a Twitter post or put it wherever your social media is, is and say, go check it out. I realize this is a very long video today. We're out 345. I was hoping to get done before that. Uh, if it's too long for you, there'll be clips in the clip channel. So you can go and get the little bite-sized um, clips, the courtesy of my good friend, Tom, who does my clips for me. Um, go check his stuff out too, because he's really good at what he does. Um, but, <laughs> and my clips are taken completely out of context. But uh, do go check that out. That's my other channel, um, which is just my clips channel in case you just want to hear something in the gym. <laughs> and let's see, what else do I got? Oh, so anyways, uh, the Patreon thing, uh, I do it once a month. It's a two-hour Zoom call uh, amongst now, I think, 15 guys. And um, you can sometimes that's a better deal because I have to necessarily charge a bit more for my my time when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one because I have to like really, I, I, I want to give you 100% of my, you know, undivided attention and focus and everything. And I want to be able to help you with your problem. And then you go and you solve it and you go and do your thing. Right. I'm not in, I'm not a psychologist. I don't play one on, on the internet, but I will give you my analysis. So I will still do, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one counseling, but probably the best way to do it is get involved in the community that of guys that I have going right now. And we're building right now. I don't have a huge one like Rich Cooper or anybody else. It's this is get in now, <laughs> get in now because I can pr probably talk to you personally and people will love to have, you know, interaction with you. So I like to have those groups. Uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying them. So, uh, Jay black kills ex-girlfriend and ex-wife Marilyn. Okay. I will look that up. Thank you for the, uh, wonderfully good news there. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, other than that, let's see what else I got going. Uh, rule zero, of course, will be Saturday uh, at 1130 a.m. Eastern. I believe it's going to be Ryan next or me, one of the two. Um, or maybe it'll be Kathy. Maybe we should throw it. Should we give it to Aaron? I think Aaron should do it next. I think we'll do that. Uh, book five is still in the process. I, I am third round of edits right now. Now is the part, now is the time where I, I decide what not to put in the book and to strip out. Um, so I am diligently working on that now that I am back from my travels. That's the problem is like, I get, get a good head of steam going on the book and then suddenly like, Oh, we need you in Texas. <laughs> what? So, all right, there you go, guys. I will see you later. Thank you for all the super chats. Thank you for all the support. I really love you, uh, especially Torsha when she gives me stickers. She is my girl. Yeah. When you see me and Torsha, you'll know what the dynamic really is. <laughs> all right, I got to go. Man, why do you come at the end? Why do you come at the end? You, you missed. No, 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 no. I'm out. Bye.